podcasts on wildgamesproductions.com and detroitradio.com. Between the time when wargamers played with chainmail and the rise of the wizards of the coast, there was an age of gamers. And unto this, Gygax, destined to bear the crown jewel of TSR upon a troubled brow, to show you all how to roll for initiative. The Roll for Initiative podcast, volume number three, issue number 101. DM Vince sitting alongside DM Nick. Hey, everybody. And DM Will. What's up? DM Matt, absent this week because it's his birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Matt. Yeah, little Matt's growing up. Oh. <laughs> Since he is a baby. Remember he was just knee high to a hobbit. Yeah, he's the baby of the group, so. Yeah, yeah true, he is. Anyway, so we're back after our 100th blockbuster episode that everybody seems to have enjoyed so far since the feedback in the forums. It's been phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Christopher Walken, phenomenal. This is great. There we go. Wow, out of control. <laughs> Wonderful. I think there was, wasn't there a, a feedback somewhere that someone's like, oh, Nick, your Christopher Walken is amazing or something, is what he said? I don't know what he's <laughs> talking about. It's it's great. Working years on it. <laughs> Kevin Pollock was on the radio the other day. He was doing this uh, Christopher Walken walking to a supermarket ordering oranges, and it was really funny. <laughs> These oranges aren't so orange. I was like, These <laughs> oranges... That's orange. They're terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, all right, well, we're back. Uh, contest is over. We are debating on who is going to be the winner. As I'm heading, handing out all the PDFs of all the contest winners, uh, entry, excuse me, to everybody this week. And uh, we'll decide, probably take a week or two to decide, and then we'll uh, announce who the winner is and congratulate them on air. Ta-da. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, yes, and then we will personally deliver books to their house. No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they will be personally delivered by the U.S. Postal Service. How about that? Oh, okay. <laughs> and Nick- well, I'm telling you, that ain't happening if someone's living in another country because I ain't going all the way to Norway to deliver three books. That, that, that That's why we've got Melman. But you won't li- deliver it to Sven. <laughs> <laughs> Who lives out in the fjords. Eating cars. Oh, I have some great news to tell y'all. Uh-oh. Mm. What? Guess who's filming at my local gaming store this weekend? Uh, He-Man. No. Oh, wow. Well. Those people, those dudes that do those uh, Darkness Rising movies, those people. Oh, oh okay. Uh, Dead Gentlemen. Dead Gentlemen Productions. Hey. Yeah, I was there yesterday. I assisted a little bit and everything. You know, the, the store owner, you know, like I said, is a friend of mine. He wanted me to play a part in the, in the, in the, in, in the movie and everything. I, said, I ain't doing that crap. I'm not doing any of that stuff. Why not? No, I, I, don't, I don't seek that kind of fame, and I, I just don't think it's very conducive for me. So, so yeah, they, I, he, his, his suggestion was, yeah, he can play, he can play, be the mad DM, the, the mad by-the-book DM and everything, where he's screaming at the players, telling them no house rules this, and you will play by my rules. This is my game, not your game. Your only role is to die. <laughs> <laughs> but so, uh, yeah, they was all there yesterday, and they was filming. They're filming today, as a matter of fact. But I wasn't going up there because I don't like getting into that stuff. You could have put your drill sergeant hat on and yelled at people. Yeah, that was kind of funny how they they thought that was pretty cute and everything. So we'll see what happens next time when they come back around and everything and use the gaming store as a uh, prop or uh, uh, a scene or area to film in or whatever you want to call it. Uh, what were they, were they shooting the opening scenes there? or well, They were shooting a whole bunch of stuff. There. I, 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 they're going to be there today and, I mean, I'm sorry, yes, they was, all, they was there all day yesterday. And all day today, so, I mean, they're doing a lot of filming there. Was it the same cast as the uh, second movie? Well, I didn't I didn't watch the movies. I'm, I'm not a fan of the movies. I don't care for that kind of stuff, really, honestly. But, oh. I mean, uh, it seems like that everyone's there. Uh, I didn't see Jen Page there. Oh. She said she was going to be in it. I was looking for her, and then when I mentioned her, no one brought her up. And, and I, I don't know what was going on. I don't, I don't know if she was going to be there or not. I was looking all over for her. Well, maybe she wasn't in that one scene that day. Yeah, whether well, that, like I said, I have no clue what's going on. So, so there you have it from the clueless reporting. Will. 
don't live. know what's going on, but it's cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool, folks. And, uh, yeah. yeah, I found them to be an interesting group of people. Mm-hmm. Interesting at the most, and mm-hmm. I noticed some nuances there along that along that line and everything. Nuances, huh? Yeah. I'll uh, explain later. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Anyway, so I've been uh, doing my face-to-face game on Saturdays. I've been running since the DM has been out of town. It's been lots of fun, so I'm, I'm having fun DMing. Good. Nick, Good. your game with the kids? Great. Just had it last night, in fact. Uh, where, and before that, had the uh, the previous weekend had the uh, our annual potluck dinner game time with my regular group, which is. Now, interesting because both groups are running. I'm running Temple of Elemental Evil, both versions, the Hackmaster version and the regular one. So, the little I'm temple, trying yeah. to keep my uh, storyline straight on both of them. <laughs> yeah, but good idea. Um, the uh, the one with the kids went okay. That was fun. They it got kind of hairy there for a while, though. They uh, they were in Hamlet and. They were told they, you know, they explained their situation, what was going on to the town council, and they said, "Well, if you, we believe there might be like spies for the temple in the town, so one way we might root them out is if you guys stay here and, you know, just for a couple of days, maybe they'll show themselves, you know, expose themselves somehow." And they they came up with an interesting plan on how to expose themselves. Basically, go to the end of the welcome wench. Uh, start up like a basically big old party, spend lots of money, and see who gets interested. And then later on that night, yeah, there was an attack. So, <laughs> how uh, how how close are the two modules together? That is, is it very confusing or? Well, th- you know, it's they're basically the same adventure, except the Hackmaster version is Temple of as Existential Evil. Yeah, right. All the elemental uh, stuff has been taken out and dealing with things like. What immorality, insanity, and I forget the other two, um, chaos and something else, is in the Hackmaster version. Yeah, because I have the the was the little little keep on the big borderland, whatever the yeah little keep on the borderlands. Yeah, I have that one for Hackmaster, and that's I was reading through that the other day, and it's a little bit different than the original. So yeah, and and it's bigger. It's probably like a mini campaign in its yeah. own right. It's really big, thick wise. Yeah, it, it's they really. F- uh, fleshed out the keep in there while in the original uh, keep on the borderlands was just kind of here's the keep here's a few pages there done have fun yeah while in the hackmaster version a lot more detail where you could pretty much use frandor's keep as it is in the hackmaster one as a base of operations maybe mm-hmm. in the future but uh other than that you know as far as temple of elemental evil not a whole lot of differences just some maybe some name changes, some other little things. Right. But most part, I mean, if you pick up either one, I mean, yeah, you can use them absolutely. They're both. I I I would have to say right now, as far as adventures, it's probably one of my favorites to run right now. So I could pick up the little keep on the borderland and run it in first edition if I wanted to. Oh yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All you got to do is like, you know, drop that twenty hit point kicker that's on all the adventures and monsters and i think you could pretty much run it there might be some little things that you know that are unique to hackmaster that you just just got to omit besides that you know but the story is things. pretty good though oh yeah yeah like uh, as far as like hit dice and damage and an armor class that's all the same all right cool well i'll talk about that a little bit later yes we will yes we will Anyway, uh, that's about all that's going on around here, and uh, we, you know, hope the Northeast is recovering from the hurricane really well. You know, that's a bad situation happened. The Nor'easter that came through afterwards, so hopefully they're recovering, got their power back, and listening to our show. Right, guys? Yay. Yay. Oh, right. I wasn't listening. I lost power. Uh, <laughs> Nick. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess Will lost power because I haven't heard a word from him yet. Will? Oh, I'm here. Oh, I'm right. just tired of the hog of the show and talk too much. Someone complained about it, so I'm just going to keep my mouth quiet. Oh. <laughs> here we go with that again. Oh, yeah, Lord. I'm going to bring it up and everything. Pigs have orc faces, and I am going to just chill out and relax and not say nothing. Let everyone else talk. Orcs have pig. Oh, no, oh, pigs oh. have orc faces again? Okay. 
Oh, yeah, pigs have orc faces. <laughs> I'm actually going to make up a monster, uh, pigs with orc faces, just for you. The, the pig, the, the orc-faced pig. Yeah. All right, let's uh, head into some uh, sage advice. Sage advice. So, sage advice this week. We got a couple emails that came in. If you want to write in, that's rfistaff at gmail.com. The first one comes from Todd, who says, Thanks for all the hours of advice and entertainment. I've been curious about the origins of one of your transitions, where a female exclaims, What are you, some kind of wizard? What is that from? Best wishes on your continued success. I have no idea what he's talking about. I guess from our from our segues into other segments. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. We'll have to ask producer Matt when he comes back. Yeah, he probably would know that one. All right, sorry about that. No Tom. comment. No comment. <laughs> next I one, the fifth. Yeah, the next one. <laughs> the next one comes from Matty J. He says, "Hi guys, for all the fun you give me and the insight into the game." Uh, to help pay back, I've attached an article you may want to, vi- how I visualize the game. Feel free to discard it or use it how you like. So he attached an article, which I'll forward to you guys later, about how he visualizes the game in his world. Oh, okay. It's an Sounds interesting good. read. Very good read. Cool. No comment. Oh, uh, well. It's not so, a joke. Well. <laughs> Actually, uh, I like things like that because it's it's when people submit their own thoughts about a game and they pull things that you you as a player or uh, as a DM would never think about and actually embellishes another person's game. And I think that's actually the stuff that I look for anytime people submit stuff, how they run their, their world and why they do. I like that kind of stuff. And uh-huh. you never know by reading through that material and hear about other people's stuff, it can inspire you too. It's like, Hey, you know, yes. I never thought of that. My, my, I, can I use that? You know, <laughs> Well, that's the whole point. Everything you know, and this is this goes to a conversation on you know on on one of the Facebook pages that I, I go from time to time when I get a chance. Now these days, I rarely get on the computer anymore. When when someone says, "Do you use house rules in a game?" and when people submit their house rules, I look at it and say, "Wow, interesting." house rules and people look at me and said do you use house rules i say no but i see some really good house rules out there i would love implement into a game yeah if it enhances the game if it makes it more interesting more fun yeah why not use it okay well you've talked long enough um (laughs) i dropped the uh the the file into the window for you guys so you can uh, view it (laughs) Yeah, I'm saving it now. Thank you. Cool. Uh, where? I'm looking out my window. I do not see it. Well, we're not going to tech anything. support you during the show too bad. I, next, I, I'm looking out my window. There's no file. No. Oh. Anyway. Oh. Next oh, email. that file. Nick. <laughs> next <laughs> email comes from uh, T-Man from the forums, and it's actually directed to me and you, Will. It's, Uh-oh. And it's based on the Dungeon Tile episode that we did. Oh. Uh, I really love the most recent podcast on making your own dungeon tiles and painting minis. Thanks for the uh, for addressing the issues of the bases because we he had asked about the metal bases. Remember about that? Oh yes. Uh, the episode inspired me to look up the DM's craft YouTube videos online for DM Scotty, and to make a few tiles of my own. However, excuse me. However, instead of spray paint, I used some other wall paint I had around the house. <laughs> Oh, okay. It, Whatever okay. works. Yeah, it worked okay, but the tiles did curl up a bit. I'm not sure if the same problem would occur with spray paint. Haven't tried it. No, actually, he recommends spray paint over any other paint, so it doesn't do that. Yes. Yeah. If you if he's if using paint on cardboard, <laughs> yes, use spray use paint. Spray paint. Do not use any type of acrylic. Uh, liquid of any kind because it's going to soak in, and once that that liquid yeah. dries up, it's going to force it to curl. Because it's so, yeah, because it's so thick. While like spray paint, you're getting a nice even light layer. He goes on to say, also instead of buying texture paint, you can use regular acrylic paint to spec the tiles. Yes. And just get an oh. old toothbrush and flick it with your finger to spray paint flex over the tile, which DM Scotty does explain in his video and also on the podcast. It works better if a little if it's a little damp, but you have to experiment on your own. I love this addition neutral episode and keep them coming. Also, where did you get the map background on your website? Any chance I can get a copy? I remain T Man. Uh that actually comes from that's a Greyhawk map. 
if you go to uh, rfipodcast.com, that was a, a one of the uh, fan-made, we're going to the website right now, it was a fan-made Greyhawk map of uh, certain, I guess, what do you call them, Dutchies or counties or whatever it's called? Mm-hmm. So, a dookie? Yeah, something like that. Well, I, mean, I don't think they call it a dookie. You, did, you said dookie. Yeah, dookie. <laughs> but, it's uh, I just figured, you know, it looked kind of cool for the new red, the new green background with the new banner by uh, Dungeon Tunes. I know. Jeff. I love the new setup on the website. It looks great. Yeah. Yes. But um, I do want to bring up one thing to T-Man. Okay. If he if he's really into making the tiles, seriously, if you're really, really into making the tiles and you have a little bit of cash, I, I don't know where T-Man lives, but... Um, Pennsylvania. He lives in Pennsylvania? Yeah, he used to live right where I was, where I lived. Okay. I mean, really look into the Hearst Art Mold side of the house. I know that, you know, it's a, a little expensive in the beginning, but in the long run, you're going to be saving a lot more money that way because I'm telling you, I even know cans of spray paint costs, you know, this much money, and then you're going to be cutting out tiles and this and that and everything else. I, I just recommend just getting, you know, the uh, the Hearst Art Art you know, molds. And then once you, you know, once you have that, you can always use it continuously, continuously, continuously keep on making them and making them and making them. You can't go wrong with that. Go on eBay. eBay, they got some on there for fifteen, twenty dollars You just need to find the ones that I use or whatever kind of ground you want to use. Mm-hmm. And make them. I mean, it's, it, like I said, t- t- time consuming, but you're getting molds that will, I mean, molds, you're getting, uh, you know, product forever. It'll last forever, provided you take care of it. Right. And you ain't got to worry about it curling up. If it curls up, you're definitely doing something wrong. <laughs> you're probably using flour instead of hydrostone. <laughs> if, the, if it curls up, you definitely have a problem, yeah. <laughs> yeah, something's <laughs> definitely wrong there. <laughs> but just a thought and everything, because, you know, I put a, I, I took a break for a while on it till I put in these bookshelves, and, and I'm going to be back working at it, at it again here in the next uh, coming week or two. Sounds like a plan. Right, our last email comes from Keith, and he says uh, he's found in, uh, a little it's called a questionnaire app online that converts your answers into what D&D stats you would have in real life. Oh, one of those. Yeah, but yeah. It's, I haven't been able to operate it because it's on Google Play or something, so I'll give you guys the address. Maybe you can figure it out, but it's uh, just real quick. It's appbrain.com slash app slash a dash d dash stats dash quiz slash com dot a d and d underscore quiz and i'll put that in the show notes for people who want to go play that i already know what mine will be i i know i'll come up as a ranger weakling no a ranger oh i thought you said weakling no what no, what huh? <laughs> what <laughs> actually we do have one more email and it comes in uh from uh todd and he's like uh, I just lost the screen. Stupid me. Talk amongst yourselves while I find it again. <laughs> so, um, how's it going there, Will? So, okay. Oh, okay. He no says, comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually from Benjamin West, and he says, Who is the great Joe DM, or the great DM Joe, and what is Hackmaster? <laughs> Oh, well, two good questions. Yeah. One we can answer. Well, the great Joe DM was a DM of mine from a long time ago that actually introduced me to D&D, and uh, I learned how to play D&D from him, and he just kind of vanished off into the distance. So uh, as we were talking about him in an earlier podcast, I think it was you, Nick, that went, the great Joe DM? Every time I said Joe. Yes. So. The great Joe DM? Yeah. <laughs> and we will go, ha oh. So that's how that joke got started. What is Hackmaster is <laughs> not an easy Good question. question. <laughs> yeah, not an easy question to answer, but we'll uh, we'll cover that a we little bit later. We should devote an episode to that. You, you think so? Yeah, I'm thinking out loud. <laughs> Keep thinking. Anyway, uh, that will end uh, Sage Advice, RFI staff at gmail.com, or you can call in 570-865-4210, the hotline. Or you can go to our website, rfipodcast.com, and uh, send us through the submission uh, letter there. Or you can go to the forums at osrgaming.org and uh, express your opinion about Will there, who's very silent. No comment. 
<laughs> is this the running gag for this show? Yeah. No, nah, I'm just messing around. No, we're going to have some fun here real soon. But as soon as we get started and tell little things, I'll be talking. I'm just saving all my energy for that. Okay. All right. Well, let's get into our first segment of Table Matters. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world, I like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. Okay, folks, uh, we're having the table manners here, and uh, we're going to talk about Hackmaster. <gasps> particularly, yeah, wow, what a coincidence! Yeah, <laughs> that I left that email for the last email, huh? Gee, uh, was that planned? Hmm. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about Hackmaster, particularly Hackmaster Fourth Edition, and well, you well, want to say, talk about you want to yeah, say but, it's the original clone because this was the original clone. Yes, and many opinions, uh, many people's opinions, including my own. I would say not only is Hackmaster the original clone of AD and D, but I would say arguably kicked off the old school Renaissance movement. Oh, yeah, okay, I'll give you that, yep. Um, so let's talk about that, how it all started. Well, Hackmaster originally started, of all places, in a little uh, magazine called Knights of the Dinner Table that's uh, owned by Kenzer and Company. And uh, it's a comic strip uh, that was started by Jolly Blackburn. And actually, it even started before that, he ran in uh, Dragon Magazine for a while, even in uh, his own published magazine called Shadis, uh way early in the 90s. But it really got its kickoff when Knights of the Dinner Table um, magazine started uh, with uh, Kenzer and Company. And it, the game Hackmaster was kind of the game that the Knights of the Dinner Table there with, you know, with uh, B.A. Felton and Brian Van Hoos and and Sarah Felton and the rest of the gang there, that's the game that they played. And it was always assumed that Hackmaster was, like, in in this little comic strip world, was the, would be analogous to AD&D, either first or second edition, however you wanted to look at it. Now, let's uh, jump ahead a few years, and it third edition D&D came out, right? Right. So previous editions were more or less null and void, right? Right. When third edition came out. Now, what was interesting is that there was lots of requests over the few years that from people that was reading the, 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 the magazine, like, when are we going to see a real game of Hackmaster? When are we going to see the Hackmaster game? Blah, blah, blah. Well, Jolly always said, well, it's basically like dungeon and dragons but how how would we ever get the licensing for that that would be impossible but um when they approached wizards of the coast around 2000 2001 they said well uh jolly and dave kenzer said well why don't why don't we do it but i think what we could do because dave kenzer by his um uh, he's a lawyer <laughs> he has a he could do a parody. He could do it as a parody. You know, like this, you know, when people do songs, a parody songs like, you know, Weird Al Yankovic does. Yes. That's why they get it. He could get away with it because it's a quote unquote parody of a song. So it's not copyright infringement. So they said, you know what? Why don't we do a parody of D&D? And uh, why don't we take, you know, the best of first edition AD&D, the best of second edition take those rules, some of the skills and power stuff that came later on, put it together, and then we'll kind of put our own little spin on it, and we'll call it Hackmaster. And that's what they did. And the Wizards of the Coast said, okay, do it. Hmm. So um, they wrote up the rules. They were released in 2001. And um, it really was uh, a pretty interesting game because I remember for myself when I saw the game of all places I was I was living up in the Seattle area I was living in Bremerton and for a brief period long story behind that but I don't even want to get into that anyway I went to the mall and there was one of those Wizards of the Coast stores 
and I'm looking around and everything. And this was like early, it was around, it was like late 2001, early 2002. Yeah, right after third edition probably hit the shelf. Yeah, you know, and I was really disillusioned with third edition. I tried it. Yeah. I, I really did. I, I, I really wanted to like it. I did. But after playing a couple sessions, I'm like, no, this isn't the game I remember. And I was really like, well, now what do I do? At first, I was kind of like thinking of going back into Warhammer 40K. I'm like, okay, I might do that, blah, blah, blah. Then I saw on the shelves, Hackmaster Player's Handbook? What the heck is this? So, And then I'm looking through it, and you know what caught my eye that really turned me on to it? I'm like... The they cover. brought back the class level names. Oh. <laughs> I, that was the thing that really got to me. I thought it was the covers that looked like the first edition covers. And, and the covers, too. I remember you know, looking at the cover. When I went into that book and I'm looking, the class level names are back. Oh, and they got this. Oh, there's new classes. And, ooh, and they got this. And what is this? I was like, this is cool. And, you know, the whole parody thing. That was part of the license agreement with Wizards of the Coast so they can publish this uh, particular game. And for some people, it's not their thing. They they thought it was a kind of a, a slap in their face. But you know what? It's just part of the fun. It's kind of like it's Gary speak in a way, but turned up to the volume to 11. Yeah. And it's not everywhere in the book, folks. It's in certain little tidbits here and there it, d- it doesn't like run rampant through the rules it's like it's really the flavor text of the of the of the books honestly i mean and and i i laughed at it i thought that was fun I, you know the, just the you know to give you an example of like uh some of the gary speak that this isn't like on page 15 of the player's handbook Chapter one, player character ability scores. One of the things is that there's two paragraphs, and it starts off, let the dice fall where they may. And if I could just read this. Before delving into the character generation process, let's talk about die rolls again. It has come to my attention. There are still some players and game masters who tolerate such players who resort to a wide range of homebrewed rules and tables which provide alternate methods of die rolling, dice rolling and generating ability scores. What a sad, pathetic situation. <laughs> I view such methodology with disdain and compared to those professional athletes who use steroids and other drugs to gain an unfair advantage in competition. <laughs> and it goes on to, from there. It's, But it's all tongue in cheek folks it's all Are you reading by the book pervatum yes oh, we'll it is be quiet you better stop that i know i only read one paragraph so oh, God. anyway you know <laughs> and there's little bits and stuff like that dropped in throughout the the books and including the game master's guide and the hacklepedia's a beast that that do that, and yes, there are some things when he when we do talk about the Hacklepedia Beast, which is Nat Hackmaster's monster manual. I mean, there are some monsters in there which are just plain darn silly slash weird. Yeah, but you know what? It when that you can ignore those things if you want to. It's your game; you bought it, you know. So. Yeah. One of the things I, I when <laughs> when talking about this game and when it came out, what I thought was very interesting is later on in 2002, the Origins Game Fair was having its awards, right? And uh, the uh, everybody was signing in uh, online or sitting in their little cards and everything to to the to Gamma to the association who does the origins awards and one of the uh, items to vote on was game of the year mm-hmm. and Hackmaster was one of the uh, games that you can vote on. Guess what game won game of the year for 2001 Hackmaster. It did. Ah. No. <laughs> Hackmaster won game of the year. 
for 2001 at the 2002 Origins. And what the cool thing was, it was John Rice Davies that, <laughs> that announced it. <laughs> I think you can find that YouTube video still floating around out there. After that year, they split up the categories for best role-playing game of the year, best board game of the year. <laughs> yeah. After that one year. So I just thought that was interesting. That, well, what uh, else came out in 2001? Well, in 2001, I don't know. I don't know. That's my whole point. If nothing else good came out, well, then, hey, hats oh, off. Oh, stop it, Will. <laughs> I do like the back of the book does say, in big, bold lettering, old school gaming, who's watching your back? Your back. <laughs> exactly. And, and that brings up a, a good point. You know, I really do believe that after what happened at Origins and also this being announced in the Knights of the Dinner Table magazine after they won the Game of the Year, I really do believe that the old school gaming renaissance got its start right there. That people were saying, you know what, we don't have to do what Wizards is doing. We can find other ways. We could bring back some of that old school gaming goodness to the table where it's, it, you know, it's. <laughs> and the irony enough of this, the Hackmaster is rules heavy. It's got a lot of crunchy bits. Don't get me wrong. But, it, but in a combination of that, it does bring some back of the old school gaming goodness where it's like. It's dangerous out there, and you know your characters aren't exactly invulnerable, and <laughs> so that's basically the history of the game, how it started, and later on, uh, right around two thousand seven, the uh, wi- uh, Wizards was going to pull their license for Hackmaster, so they couldn't use the D and D rules. So it was around that time that uh, Kenzer and Co. decided, you know what, we're going to continue with Hackmaster, but we're going to do it differently. And they came up, they, there was a lot of ideas that were um, kicked around. And they basically came up with their new system uh, that was introduced in Hackmaster Basic in 2009. And now, which came up with uh, regular I guess some people call it advanced Hackmaster, but regular Hackmaster now, the new fifth edition of Hackmaster that came out uh, just recently in the past year or so. But, uh, yeah, they, and that's where it stands right now. But Hackmaster fourth edition, as it is, um, far as comparing itself um, with, like, first edition or second edition, like I said, it's takes the in my opinion takes the best parts of first edition AD&D takes the best stuff of second edition puts together and and it makes that rule set there's some other unique crunchy bits that are part of Hackmaster which we'll probably talk about a little bit later but um as far as compatibility I would say absolutely 100% backward compatible with first edition or second edition uh, partic- yeah, with either one. So, I mean, there's some things you have to omit, but for the most part, it's the same game. If you know how to play first edition, that's 75% of Hackmaster right there, to tell you honestly. So, um, Looking back at 2001 for the any, any Awards, now they won an any Award or they won a Gen Con Award? They won the Origins Award for Game of the Year. Oh, Origins. Okay, I thought you said uh, Gen Con. Sorry. No, no, it was Origins. I apologize. Continue. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, but um, I would say as far as, like, the different bits compared with first edition, um, there's other things like hmm, Honor, for example. There's a – there's a, a – thing that has to do with honor in yes. Hackmaster. Yes, I was actually going to flip to that and ask you about that. And uh, Yeah, honor is a very interesting... Chapter 5. Uh, there you go. A mechanic that is in Hackmaster that um, is called... You know, and there's ways of determining that. Honor is 
Well, uh, it's how you're – It's and that doesn't – for one thing, I have to say, it doesn't have to do with how your character is good or bad. It just means how he conducts himself. So you can have, you know, a, a very goodly knight, but, you know, through – various unfortunate circumstances could present <laughs> he could have a like very low honor so it's like it's a it's a measure of the deeds accomplished by the player character or the individual i'm mean, npcs and even monsters can have honor too so and how he is you know the people he associates sell himself with in his party um success in combat politics obedience to the parameters of one's character's class loyalty Talent and success, qualities that can be held by any character regardless of alignment. So that's what honor gauges. And there are some perks having honor. There is, uh, you know, how what honor does is it, there's with the game mechanic itself, it's determined initially when you create your character by adding up all your ability scores and dividing that by the number of ability scores, and that's your starting honor. And then there's like a, a range in the book. It's on page 84, and that tells you where your honor lies. Say your honor starts at 15. Well, that's average honor. Mm -hmm. And then you have what's called an honor die. Now, honor die is used whenever your character increases in level, when you increase your ability scores, which you can do in Hackmaster, and they increase percentage-wise. Um, you can use your honor die whenever you uh, have increasing in skills when you level up. You can use your honor die when to increase your percentage in skills. You also use your honor die, which... Um, for like a very heroic or epic uh, way of accomplishing a task that could be, you know, do or die, what you can do is use 10 points of your honor to add your honor die to a particular role or result. <clears throat> For example, I have, maybe I had a character who had like uh, 80 points of honor right. and... My character is uh, ninth level, but let's say they were fighting like uh, a, a a red dragon, and my my uh, my fighter wanted to make absolutely sure that he was going to hit with his plus one plus four sword versus reptiles. <clears throat> okay. So what he can do is purge ten points of his honor. <clears throat> And use your honor die, which I think like would be like a D10 or D12. Maybe add it to my to hit roll. Oh, oh, okay. So it's like the action dice that they did with D20 years later. Yeah, kind of like that. Oh, yeah, okay. It's kind of like that, but you can use either to a to hit roll. Maybe you want to use that your honor die to uh, your damage roll, or maybe use it to. Yeah, for a damage roll to a weapon or to spell or maybe to increase the duration of a spell or um, it's it's a way of like, you know, kind of taking it to heroic, almost thematic type levels if you want to. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> honor, you have being that range, you have average honor, but you can also be dishonorable or be in great honor. Or having too much honor. Yeah, <laughs> excess honor, yeah. Yes, you can have excess honor. Now, average honor, that's okay. You're fine. You know, you're doing good deeds. You're, you know, you're helping the old lady across the street. You know, you're slaying dragons and, you know, rescuing fair maidens. Now, great honor, that means you're going above and beyond the call of duty, my friend. You're doing really great. And one of the great things of being in great honor, you get a plus one to all of your die rolls as long as you're in the great honor window. You know, to hit all your damage rolls, all your saving throws, um, all of that. Everything has a plus one to the die roll if you're in great honor. 
Dishonorable, it's just the opposite effect. Your dishonor, it's minus one to all your die rolls. <laughs> how, does so, that, how does that affect evil characters, though? Um, well, like I said, just because one is evil doesn't necessarily mean you're dishonorable. True, um, but an evil person is not really going to help an old lady across the street, for example. Oh, no, but uh, say, for example, uh, like an evil, like a like a uh, uh, anti paladin, he still might have some sense of honor when he fights. Yeah. So this is more based on the like the uh, Oriental Adventures honor system type. Yeah, way. Uh, yeah. Actually, to, to analogy, yeah, that would be kind of based on the Oriental Adventures honor system. That would be a good example. So yes. It's actually a good way to keep a character in check for their alignment. In other words, um, could be, could be, but it's not necessarily directly uh, tied to alignment. It's. Um, it's more about how the character is interacting with the his the other player characters, the world around him. If he's staying, maybe staying with his alignment, that is a factor. Okay. Uh, but it's not the overall determinant of it. All right. Uh, well, let's just say I was picking this up and I'm like, oh, honor, eh, I don't want to play with that. Will that break the game? Absolutely not. Okay, cool. Absolutely not. You can leave the honor system out if you want. And there's also another kind of uh, thing that's tacked on honor. There's another thing that's called fame. Yes. And fame is related to the uh, to the honor uh, stat, if you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And fame, it, I, if I'm trying to remember, if you reach an honor of 80 or more, your fame is also... Uh, how how do I put it? Your fame also increases throughout the land too. That means you know ba- bards are singing about you, and <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's there is that fame associated with it as well. But honor is probably the one that um, is more on your day to day doings of of your player character. So that's like one thing that's kind of unique to yeah. Hackmaster. Your fame is um, ten times pretty much your level divided by ten. Right, so it's a it's like a quarter or a piece of your of your honor. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, dipping into more about the honor, I noticed there's some goofy things here, like stealing honor. Yes, you can have what are called like honor duels. Yes, I, I was yeah. reading that, and uh, you could like have like the infamous like slap fight type thing. You yeah, you honor, can, honor from yeah, other people. You could do the. Uh... You could do the pimp slap thing. You could steal. On- there are actually like skills where, um, like uh, one of the one of the loopholes that my players have found in the rules is there's a there's a, a skill called uh, rules of fair game. Yeah, and it could be any sort of type of rule that they can, you know, any sort of game that they can make out of something like a situation. If they make their skill, they get two points of honor. Um, one thing I do have to uh, explain about honor, though, is you have your your actual honor stat, and then you have what's called temporal honor, what's, or you could call it temporary honor. It actually takes four points of temporal to make one real point of honor. So you gain this temporal honor when you're when you're playing the game, and you convert those into the actual honor that's part of your honor stat. And who's keeping track of that, the player or the GM? Uh, the player. Okay. The player takes uh, track of that. And usually honor is divvied out at the end of the game st- session when experience points are. Uh, oh, hit. okay. So, so you that's have to, how I do it. So you really don't have to sit there during the game erasing and rewriting and erasing and rewriting. Okay. Right. Unless there's an actual situation that calls for it. Mm-hmm. At the end of the game okay. session, uh, I always do experience points and then honor. Right. Okay. And there's a beautiful chart that's in the in the GM's guide or on the Game Master's Shield too. And there's all different situations that are a list of like how you can lose and gain honor. And if that is dependent on your alignment, yes. Yeah, it actually is actually very useful. Yeah, I've seen uh, that. I can actually <laughs> pull it out here on the the GM screen. Oh jeez. That GM it's, screen is amazing with all those flaps and everything. Oh on yeah. It. It's it's wonderful. Um one of the, where's the one that was really interesting? The pizza um, one? Heroic death. If your character dies, you immediately get 
any regardless of your uh, uh, alignment, you get five points of temporal honor. Um, uh, fleeing a battle that's obviously going poorly. Now, if you're any of the good alignments, you will lose a point of temporal honor. Um, now, when you get into like chaotic neutral, you actually get a point of temporal honor. <laughs> So if you <laughs> flee a battle that's going poorly, if you're CAC neutral, oh, it's okay. You get to get a point of temporal at the end of the game session. Oh, wow. And the honor dice can go up as far as a D20? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you're rolling an extra D20 for your bonus. Yes. Holy cow. That's and one thing about uh, Hackmaster that I should mention to everybody is there is um, when you... You uh, when you roll a die, and this doesn't have to be your honor die, uh, but like for damage, particularly, mm -hmm. um, say uh, it rolls over if you roll maximum. If, if I guess you could almost call it following through, right? Okay. So like if you were hitting with a uh, long sword uh -huh. and you do a D eight point of damage, and you rolled an eight. Uh -huh. That you roll again, and you roll that D8 minus 1. If you keep on rolling 8s, it goes up to, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's kind of like an exploding die type thing. Yeah, it is, essentially. Oh, okay. And you have that not just with weapons, but with spells. Oh, wow. Also, um, that does that when you're increasing skills. Right. Um, oh, you we can increase here. skills with an exploding die, too. Wow, amazing. Yeah, so yeah, your sp skills go. It doesn't do it with uh, hit points, though. Oh. Go up in hit points, it doesn't do that. No. <laughs> but um, you do get what's known as that 20 hit point kicker when you first start out. I, I want to quickly just jump over to Chapter 4, Nick. Oh, sure. Where it chapter has uh, building points and building your character. Yes. I don't want to get into it too deep because Will's going to talk about character classes next, but I just wanted you to explain a little bit about how the, the building points and how that works. Yeah, building points or BPs is um, basically when you create your character, uh, the building points are used to uh, basically just how to create your character. And certain things take building points to do it. And you gain building points from taking a particular race and a particular class. And you get more building points when you talk when you when we get into things when we talk about quirks and flaws. The building points are used when you buy talents and skills for your character when you're first starting out. Talents and skills sounds like a, a later edition almost. And almost yeah. yes, because talents are different than skills because talents are a one-time buy mm -hmm. when you first create your character, and they're kind of like innate abilities that your character has versus skills which are things that you can learn um, like um, like for example a talent would be something like uh, ambidextrous right like what like elves have oh okay versus, versus something like um, first aid which is a skill that you can learn okay but let me ask you this though Yes. Since we're talking about it, I, you know, I think we're just, you know, beating around the bush and everything. It, it just, it just, it doesn't matter what it's called, a talent, a skill, or a feat. It's all the same thing. And just like Vince said, this is something that is very relative and, and comparable to a future edition of D&D &D yeah. that we all know about. I mean, first aid is just that. For it's, it, it does something, and, and, and whether you, it's a one-time buy or whether, you, you know, you can put multiple points into it later on, it's still pretty much the same thing. Yeah, yeah. No, they're not. Okay. Yeah, they are. No, they're not. Talents and skills are different. How are they different? Because talents, you only buy them one time. I mean, that's a, what I just said. I said besides oh. the fact that you just buy one one time and you really can't you know, make it better later on, it, it's basically the same premise. The, the difference between what talents and skills, though, is talents, there's no percentage role to them. Skills, there are. So there's a Exactly. Well, but what I'm saying is, though, it's the same thing. It does the same thing, whether it's a first aid in 
D20 or First Aid and Hackmaster. Okay, How, I see what you're saying. That's what I'm talking uh, okay, about. Okay, I friend. got you. I realize I got- that, yeah, we, you know, we can beat around the bush and everything and say this sounds like that. This is saying tomato, tomato. <laughs> and, and this is one thing, Hackmaster, D20, and all these other systems, everything. They just call it something different and just apply a different type of mechanic to it. It's basically the same thing, even though you use it differently or you earn it differently or you purchase it or whether you, you know, whatever. That's what I was just saying. That's all. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. The, the talents are a lot like feats in the later edition. Exactly. That's what I'm looking at. That is yeah. exactly what they are. Now, the only thing about the difference okay. between the two is that one, you you purchase it, and it's a one time purchase. Does it look like you can improve on talents? Am I correct? No, you can't. See, and that's the only difference between talents and difference. feats. Whereas yeah. feats in future editions, you can constantly improve in them. Right. But yeah, keep on continuing, please. Yeah, because yeah. like yeah, the the talents. In, in Hackmaster, once you buy them, I mean, the only way you can stack them is if you buy them multiple times the first time you buy them. <laughs> oh, you can if stack them too? Wow. Um, some of them you can. Some of them you can. Others you cannot. Is there advanced talents that you can purchase later on that will improve upon it? No. Okay, so it's different than feats then. It's just it's on the same yeah. premise, but it's different. Yeah, like I, like I said is, yeah, uh, the uh, the talents are like like a like a um, crossbow bonus. Uh, you got a plus one to hit with a light crossbow. You can stack that if you buy it multiple times with building points, but um, you only buy those talents at the beginning of character creation. And does the GM determine how many building points you get, or is it based upon that's? That's determined when creating your character. When you're sitting down with the GM and you're creating a character, uh, for example, um, if you were going to make a character and um, each different race has building points associated with it. All right, you know, you, you know what? Just, we'll yeah. stop that right here. We'll we'll continue that in the next segment with Will. Oh yeah, and you could jump in and, and explain that part. No, oh, it's all oh. good. No, he can he can cover everything because basically, you know, I'm just going to jump in at that time when it comes to it. I mean, you know, it just uh, I was going to cover too much on on the those ability points and everything on that as far as building characters. I was just showing you know the relationship between first and second. I mean, first and, and you know, Hackmaster. Right. Well, he well he'll jump in then. Anyway, yeah, he, he, he can interrupt any time. I, I forget to I fail to mention something. Right. So the compatibility with one e in this. The compatib- like I said, compatibility with first edition and Hackmaster, uh, they're fully backward compatible. Uh, like I said before, there might be a few little um, uh, uh, things that are unique to Hackmaster, like honor that you can drop, and that won't affect a thing. So you could take an adventure that was written for Hackmaster and port it right into first edition with little to no tweaking at all. Do I need skills? What, what, what was Do that about honor again? What? You said it's not in first edition? You said well, you could drop I mean, it. In, in drop. Regular, well, no, you do have first edition in AD&D, but I, I'm not talking honor. About honor. You talk about honor. Yeah, I, I, it came from Oriental Adventures, but yeah, not everybody right. used it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, good to go. Yeah, so, yeah, you don't have to use the honor system if you don't want to. And what about skills? Um, if I don't like skills in my game? Yeah, you could drop those, too. It okay. shouldn't affect it if you're using an adventure for yeah, you could port over things uh, if you want to the first edition. I know a lot of people what they looked at they they definitely mine Hackmaster for things that they is it that's interesting like some of the monsters they might want to port over. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. some of the some some of the classes, some of the races. You could definitely po- uh, port over the first edition with a little bit of tweaking. How do they add up side by side as far as? Character classes and monsters. Do you think Hackmaster is a little bit weaker or stronger? Um, I would say, ah, oh, darn. You know, I do have to to let the maybe gauge this a bit better. Uh-huh. Is I do have a hack first edition AD and D to Hackmaster conversion document <laughs> okay. that was made, and when uh. Hackmaster first came out, so you can take your uh, first edition AD and D characters and convert them over to Hackmaster. If I can find the darn document, I will pull it up. I w- I would say though on on the uh, on the whole, they are. 
I think Hackmaster characters are probably a little bit more powerful. Well, the reason why I bring that up is because I remember back when this came out and we were still playing 1E and people were like, oh, Hackmaster, that's a Munchkin game. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people say that's a Munchkin game. It's for Munchkins or Power Gamers. <laughs> it can be. It can Only be. People that want to play... uh, you know what? That, that can be spoken for most any game that, yeah. where, that where you do character builds and you have that. That, that can be spoken for any game. So I dismiss that. I know, but that's how I had it described to me when I first saw it in the store. And you know what, Vince? That is absolutely correct. And that's one thing I despise about you know certain... You know, just the, just the genre in, in, in the nerd community that when you ask someone about a game, they said, you don't want to play Hackmaster. That's just for munchkins. Yeah, Instead right. of telling people something like that, I mean, tell it from a different you know perspective and make it sound professional and, and yeah. not from such a you know, misguided point. Because, yeah, it may be for munchkins, but there is a lot of good things about Hackmaster I like. And I don't think it's it's, it's primarily targeted for munchkinisms and, or munchkin, munchkin people and power gamers and min-maxers. And, and, yeah, and one thing... Thing that balances it out, in my opinion, is when they get to the combat section, when, when we're going to talk about critical hits and fumbles. Well, that's the end of the yeah. And you're going to see from there that all that monstrosism, it, it goes both ways. Monsters will be just as deadly as the player characters. But right. as I, what I was going to say as far as the, you know, as far as which is a little more powerful, I would say the Hackmaster character is a little bit more powerful just for the simple fact that in your character ability scores can go up in Hackmaster versus uh, and through the normal advancement process. If I versus would've... in first edition, where if you're going to increase ability scores, it's generally through magic. If I would have known what I know now about Hackmaster after preparing for this show and, and you know reading the books over the last year or so, I wish I would have not listened to that guy in the gaming store who I trusted at the time and picked up the book and would have been able to have some new found uh, adventures in this new gaming system yeah. that was like the gaming system I was playing all along. Yeah, it's like I said, it's like it's like 75% of it is like everything you already know except for some little crunchy bits here and there. We, we play- and, and if you want to stick with first edition and you look at Hackmaster, there is no reason why you couldn't take like little bits and pieces of Hackmaster and pour it into first edition. Oh, definitely, yeah. I, I I like looking. I looked at it and after reading it for this more in depth, I, I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I wish I would have picked it up back then. And it, I, I would. And for for me personally, it got me interested in role playing again because there was that time for a couple of years there. Yeah. Where I was like, I was totally. I was not interested in third edition. I wanted something. I wanted my old game back. I couldn't find any players. And then I found out about this, and I found some other people here that were playing. And next thing I know, ten years later, we're still going strong. There you go. <laughs> Just maybe not with the edition you like at the moment, but you know. But you know what? And it's okay. We're having fun. It's. Is there still a big fourth edition society or no? Well, there is. Well, there. It what when the Hackmaster Association there is the Hackmaster Association the HMA, which you could be a part of, which is uh, I was a part of for a while. But now and, it's based on um, the new stuff, isn't it? It what? It's based on the new stuff now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay. But when it, yeah, when it first off, you could be a, a either a GM or a player uh, in the Hackmaster Association, and you register. You could register your characters with the HMA and. You go to if you went to tournaments uh, that were sponsored by Kenzer Co, uh, like at Origins or Gen Con or wherever. You, if one of the cool things I was, uh, it was fun was you went to a tournament and if you one of the players uh, did well in the scoring system and and won the tournament, you got a serialized magic item. It had a serial number and everything. It was a unique magic item that your player had for their player character. That was cool. kind of the fun thing. I got actually two, three, three players in my group that got serialized magic items cool. through uh, tournaments, which is kind of fun. So, Any reason but the 4E? Is that just a, a joke because of 3E at the time? or It actually is a joke because in the original Knights of the Dinner Table magazine, the original... Game was Hackmaster Third Edition, and, and then, well, if you look in the back of the the original player's handbook, it does say 
Uh, and while this is the fourth edition of the Hackmaster game, in another time, another edition or alternate universe, <laughs> this could have been easily been called 3E. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So it's, I guess you could call it the fourth, it, it, they call it the fourth edition. It really isn't. But um, just kind of <laughs> playing along with the whole thing that was happening in the Knights of the Dinner Table uh, comic book, that, yeah, that they call it fourth edition. I was lucky enough to get when I got my player's book that it still actually had the coupons in the back. Yes, the player's coupons. And, and Can you briefly explain how those run throughout the game? Yeah, the coupons are interesting. It's Some people like it, some people don't. It really is kind of a split on it. It's almost, it's kind of a metagaming thing oh, okay. it, in a way. Um, and there are GM coupons too. But in the back of, like, the player's handbook and also the, the four splat books for the different character classes, there are what are called Hackmaster coupons that you can redeem uh, for like, maybe during the character creation process or during a time in the game that you want to avoid, want to, um, you want to create a situation. Like, for example, like in mine is... Uh, one of the Hackmaster coupons is I stab at thee. Good for one plus one dagger. <laughs> so you can redeem that to the DM. Like maybe, for example, maybe all your magic items got stolen and you said, okay, the heck with this. I'm ripping out the coupon. At least I'm going to get a plus one dagger. <laughs> well, here's the thing about the coupons, though. And this is how I have always played the coupons uh, as a GM. If a player plays a coupon, then I likewise will play a coupon against the players. Don't know who it's going to be against. Might not be against that one player, but it's going to be randomly happening. And a lot of a lot of a lot of DMs do that too. Um, one other coupon. Uh, what were you thinking? Uh, one free mulligan on a die roll, so you can mulligan a die roll. And that's one of the things that you could do when when that ties into honor, I forgot to mention. You get one free mulligan die roll per game session if your character is in great honor. Oh, okay. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, one healthy ombre, good for 1d6 points of healing. So, yeah, you can play... Uh, and you can play these Hackmaster coupons... So most groups, at least that I knew, they don't use them a lot because of GM retribution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was one, but like I said, those are the players' one. There's GM ones here too, like out of the uh, the GM's guide. Uh, let's see, fumble fingers. You have failed your thieves skill roll, critical fumble, or uh, nice. suspicious dice. Roll again. You must accept the new results. Um, was there a way to get new ones? Did they print them in like the comic book or something? There or? was some in the book comic. There were some through the Hackmaster Association magazine. And also there was, uh, which is now for a lot of players, the Hackmaster was like gold, the um, the GM coupon book, which I do have a copy of. <laughs> huh. There was a coupon book just made for, for Game Masters. So. Cool. Yeah, the, the the coupons are kind of a meta gaming thing. Not all groups used them. So, where I really saw them in use was at tournaments. Yeah, I figured that's what it was. I saw the coupons come out during tournaments. Oh yeah, <laughs> everybody had their mulligan coupons at the ready, so they wouldn't die or something like that. And for those folks out there looking, I'm looking on Amazon right now. The Hackmaster Player's Handbook for 4E, uh, twenty one dollars used. The Hackmaster official Game Master's Guide, a dollar fifty used. So there you go. Oh, range in price from one to twenty bucks. Uh the little keep on the borderland, which we spoke about before, used ten bucks. Yeah. Uh the Hackomedia Beast Volume of Beast, Volume One, uh four ninety five. And uh the Smackdown of my Sla the Smackdown Slavers, I guess that's a joke on the Slaver series. Yes. Smackdown of the Slavers. Uh, brand new, actually, nine ninety five. Yeah. So, yeah, sounds like the price is anywhere between one to twenty bucks. Uh, the Hackmaster Hidden Shrine. I don't know what was that a joke off of. Uh, yeah, it's a parody of Hidden Shrine Tomoe Chan. Ah, okay. They they did, uh, Hackmaster versions of Hidden Shrine Tomoe Chan, 
uh, Slave Lords, <laughs> Temple of Elemental Evil, uh, Ghost Tower of Inverness, Giant uh, against the Giants, uh, <laughs> Descent into the Depths of the Earth. Hack Jammer, I guess is a joke on Spell Jammer. Yeah, someone actually did Spell Jammer, and I got the Hack Jammer stuff. It's it's okay yeah. if you're into that sort of thing. Um, I know a couple people in the forums were into Spell Jammer, so. Yeah, yeah, it, that would be good if you can't get the original Spell Jammer stuff, or you want to add on to it. There's some good stuff in there if you're if you're into that sort of thing. I'm not too particular into it. Um, Hackmaster Robinloft, I guess Ravenloft joke. Yeah, that's a that's that's parody off of Ravenloft. Yes. I'm trying to think about other ones. There was, um, uh, was it, uh, was the Lizard King module they did a Hackmaster version of? The Quest for the Unknown. Which is like module B1. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ten bucks for that. Pretty much the Hackopedia of Beasts volumes are all ranging from four to six dollars a piece, which is pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad. And the big one you want to get, uh, the Hacklopedia of Beasts, it's the Monster Matrix. Because then you have, when you get a hold of the Monster Matrix, you can make all different variants of all different monsters. (laughs) One of the things I still get to this very day, when I beefed up some Hobgoblins (laughs) in in the Slave Lord uh, series, I made them... They were red, one-eyed Venusian hobgoblins. Oh, the Venusian variant creatures, um, when they die, they have a chance of exploding. <laughs> and, dude, 1 to 20 points of damage in like a 10-foot radius when they die. So <laughs> they didn't like me for that at all. <laughs> uh, see, the uh, Hackmaster Demon Tower of Madness. Jeez. Yeah, it's, that's, wow, that's the one. Expensive. Like, oh, really? Fifty bucks. Wow. Yeah, that's the one. Like Ghost Tower of Inverness. Ah, uh, <laughs> the color activity book. <laughs> yeah, I have that. The color activity book. I think you could still get that as a PDF off their Probably. website. Come to think of it, I'm just trying to find the the. That was it the Matrix you were just talking about? The Monster Matrix, yeah. That's a, probably a hard one to find. Yeah, I'm not seeing it at all on here. Yeah, that's a tough one to find. You might have to go to your friendly local game store to find that one or go through some other um, online uh, uh, stores, maybe Noble Knight Games or, I don't know, somebody else. They maybe might have it. Half Price Books or never know. Maybe Half Price Books, they might have it. Sure. Gods and demigods. <laughs> yep, 50... that's the that's the deities and demigods book. It does have Cthulhu mythos in it. Fifty dollars. Yeah. Uh, the Griff Master's Guide to Life's Wildest Dreams. Yep, those are your splat books. Uh, the four character, uh, basic four character gla- classes. You have the Griff Master's Guide to Life's Wildest Dreams is for your thieves. Mm-hmm. You have the Combatant's Guide to Slaughtering Foes. For your fighters, the Zealot's Guide to, for, to World Conversion, which is for your cleric types, and the Spellslinger's Guide to World Domination, which is for your magic user types. And the cool thing about them, I didn't discover this till like a few years later. Mm-hmm. All four of these books, if you look at the covers, yeah, you put them together, uh-huh. they make one big uh, mural. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I'm looking at the camera I'm like, why does this look like? Oh, it's all one big scene. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm like, how come I never caught that like three years ago? So, the, Yeah, the Monster Matrix is 80 bucks used. Yeah, that's a rarity, I that's, guess. Yeah, that's a rare one. All right. So that's the history and everything else. And we thank About you for the- that. Oh, sure. No problem. Uh, and let's head over to our, our new segment to the show called DM Rules. And uh, we'll head over to that now. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want, but are a very particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. DM Rules. DM rules? 
that's me. That's Will doing DM rules today. <laughs> Finally, Matt, you're done talking and everything. Matt. Oh, I mean Nick. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you were talking sorry. so long, I didn't even know who was talking. So no, I'm just messing around. I'm just messing around. You anyway, know, I am the I am the the the, the hackmaster kind of expert here. So well, yeah. You know I... what my mom told me a long time ago? Never let anyone know how smart you are. You'd be shocked at how much I might know. No, nah, I'm just messing with you. Ah, very good. No, nah, no, nah, I'm giving you a hard time. No, no. I, I'm not a huge fan of Hackmaster. I'll be straight up and point, you know, I mean, blunt to the point of being brus. I, I don't care for Hackmaster. Um, it's, like I said, the compatibility with first edition, very, very simple, very easy and everything. And you're, you're going to see that here when we talk about the character generation, the combat, um, the description of combat, how combat is done. And uh, I think you'll like it, Vince, as far as the initiative is concerned. But we'll discuss this here for later. Let's talk about character generation, though. Okay. Mm -hmm. Character generation, and, and anytime I say anything incorrect there, please let me know. Nick? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's almost like first edition. Pretty much the same stats. Strength, dex, con, intel, wisdom, charisma, adds commonness and honor, which are the two new stats. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, we do have commonness in first edition via the UA, the Unearthed Arcana, and we have the honor stat, or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. from the Oriental Adventures, but they have a little different play on it as far as Hackmass is concerned. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think in first edition D&D uh, &D with the Unearthed Arcana where you can have too much honor. Yeah, I don't believe he could either. Yeah, yeah. In, in yeah I don't think there was can. any you know bonuses if you had too much honor. If it came down to it, you want to have... So much honor because if you lose honor, if you lose too much, you can't be a certain character class like the samurai and whatever yeah. all, all those other classes were back in that time period. Mm -hmm. When you got too much honor, you just become renowned. That's all. Yeah, exactly. You know, you become famous. Now, it wouldn't be nothing where bards would be singing your name all over the place and people wouldn't be worshiping you and flocking to you. But I guess someone could make it to where it could be like that. They might write stories about you, but who knows? <laughs> Uh, character generation, which is a really interesting, but, uh, unlike first edition and everything, you know, first edition has numerous methods of rolling up characters, and uh, I think one of the best ones was in the Honor Thurkana, uh, depending on your class, and it was only for humans anyway, but in Hackmaster, from what I see, it's only 3D6. That's correct. And once you roll those three six-siders, you assign the score to that stat. It's 3D6 now, I, down the line. You yeah, I did not see anything that's saying you write it on a piece of paper and assign them to various stats. You go strength down, all the way, roll, that's your score, that's the way it's going to be. You got it. Now, uh, the, from what I see here, you could have a minimum of one all the way up to 25, which is on par with, you know, D&D. &D. But you're, mm -hmm. we all know that you're not going to get 25 or 20 and all that unless, and we'll talk about it as that comes to it and everything. One thing that Hackmaster has that, the first edition almost has, and I'll cover this here, is the fractional ability scores. Yep. Which is actually a very, very great system. This is one thing I was very pleased to see on the Unearthed Arcana. Again, the Unearthed Arcana already beat Hackmaster to the punch on this. You all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. For the, the Cavalier class. The Paladins. The Barbarians. Pa Yep, all of them do. All those the fighter classes have that ability to have mm -hmm. their fractional ability scores. Every time you level up, you roll. Well, actually, what happens is when you roll up that stat, you're going to roll a D100, and that's where I think it's where it starts off at. Yeah, that's correct. That's your percentage. And then as you level up, you roll. What was I? I can't even write down for the rhyme. I'm thinking two different things here. But you're going to roll. But eventually, when that score gets to a hundred, your main that that score that 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 uh, that, uh, that percent right. on a statue will go up one point. Um, actually, it goes up. Um, what'll happen is when you level your character, depending on what class it is, it'll go up a particular die. For example, on a fighter, and this is all fighter types. Could be a cavalier. Could be a, a knight errant. Whatever it may be, I'm you. I don't, I'm talking about the UA, how they did it in there. Oh yeah, it only went up a, a a percentage point, right? Yeah, it only went up one point, and and when you had like um, percentile strength, right? You know, and it all worked like that there. But now with this game with Hackmaster, it almost works the same, and it does function differently with different characters. Yeah, and it's open to all classes now. You yeah. don't have to be a fighter class to get the fractional scores. Exactly. Which, you know, is, 
some option when you use the UA and think like this, how can I apply this to my magic users, clerics and druids and so on to other classes? Look at Hackmaster and look at this rule here and apply it, you know, to a certain sense. Mm-hmm. With, and I mean, that's, I think that's the best thing. And that will, ex- that will help, you know, some people that really dwell into this much deeper than they normally wouldn't, usually would do. Say like, well, if my character levels up, uh, he should be getting, you know, a higher strength. He should be more, you know, you know, all that more resistant to poison and so on and so on. And I agree to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. And that will offset, you know, the penalties when you age. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So just a thought here. So take a look at those fractional ability scores. I think that's a very awesome concept. That's a very yeah. good habit. And in, in a way, it does make sense because you go up in levels, your character gets a little more experience and uh, ability scores should increase, maybe not in much in certain areas and that depends on your class also i just want to point out that this hackmaster does something that i thought was amazing which any edition of any game should do is a step-by-step creation process yes on page 341 <laughs> of the book of the player's yes. book that's excellent because believe me as soon as i'm done talking i'm going right back to talk about those coupons and everything which fourth edition D D did oh they yeah. did do that i didn't know Top that parts the fortune cards oh yeah. yeah, they basically stole it from Hackmaster. Uh, don't you even go there. No. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> okay, so um, level limitations on demi-humans does apply in this game. Okay. Uh, new character races. Uh, I found them kind of odd. Pixie? Gnomelings, pixie yes. fairies, and that, um, that, that uh, grunge elf. The grell. And also you have half-ogres. Oh, the half ogres, yeah, that one too. I skipped that well, over. And a, gnome titans. Who's going to play a pixie fairy? Or you gnome... would be surprised. <laughs> and you know what? Pixie fairies, you would not think are so. You know, they're great magic users and they're great thieves. Do you know where that concept comes from, though? What? That comes from that computer old uh, computer game called Fantasy. If you remember those. Okay, let's see. Pixie fairies at a glance, which is really cool. I like how they do this, by the way. Oh, here they we box, go. They box it out. No, this is really cool. Will <laughs> they tell you right away instead of you having to read the whole entire thing to figure out what it does? It just like it does kind of like how White Wolf did his things. So it just kind of puts it in the box and says, "Here's what you get if you're too lazy to read." <laughs> mm-hmm. Racial much. bonuses fly at eighteen. As I guess that's inches per round or feet per round. Yeah. Can use giant moth and butterfly mounts. <laughs> Plus yeah. two to hit in mounted combat. Heal an extra hit point uh, per day. Never surprise telepathic link. When you a fairy dies, is reincarnated one to four months. May cast a uh, fairy phantom spell once a day. And at fifth level, they may cast a minor sphere of perturbation. Yeah. Spell once per day. And then it goes into the initial languages, the talents that it has automatically, what it's allowed to play, what it can multiclass into. Instead of flipping pages round and round, uh, what its ability modifiers are, you get a plus one to intelligence, plus one to wisdom, plus two to dexterity, minus six off the strength, plus two to charisma, and plus three to comeliness. I guess you're kind of sexy. but uh, And it gives you the building points bonus, so you get an extra 14 points. And then additional talents will tell you other things that they can purchase under the talent trees, I guess. And, and then, then it gives and you then, the, then it, it gives you the downside. Then it tells you the bad part of it, and then it goes over that into various ticks over there. But I just wanted to point that out. That's all. No, yeah. and you're right, and that I think is an excellent. You know, when they did this rule book for Hackmaster, this is something that you know that should have been done with first edition. Oh, yeah. But you know, we had to be realistic when Hackmaster came out and first edition. Let's just you know, we know where that is all going to go. One thing I did notice about the Pixie Fairy, it can cast a, a form of magic, and again, this is something that comes from other editions, and that's that the tattoo. Tribal yeah, they magic. have they yeah. have tribal tattoo magic. Which is a very interesting concept. I'm a huge fan of that from a, a, another game, and I really like that concept. That was in second edition, wasn't it? I saw something in second edition for tattoo magic, and I think that was in a Dragon magazine. I that there was a- is all. There was also a book that was produced just all about pixie fairies for Hackmaster. Wasn't yeah. the tattoo magic in Dark Sun? I can't recall right now at the time. I have to look it back up, but I know there was a there was a dragon magazine that, that talked about the different forms of magic, which was the tattoo right. magic. There was animal magic and all this other stuff. I have to look at it. painting magic. 
All right, go on. I apologize. No, it's all good. Yeah, there, I believe that you're, you're correct there too as well. That there was some books on the Pixie Fairy, you know. Yeah, there's, there is. There, there, there was a, a Pixie Fairy book that was done. Yep. So as you see there, you can see that they had different races and everything, and and that's okay. It's something new. Um, the same thing can be done and spoken for for first edition AD and D. You're just going to have to apply some common sense to it when when creating these these new races and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I saw some. Oh, the. the the Thug Halflings. Yes, Thug yeah. Halflings. I forgot about them too, the Thug Halflings. I thought that was pretty interesting. It's yes. no different like their cannibalistic, you know, halflings from Dark Sun. You don't want to run into those bad boys. Yeah, they're, they're kind of like that. Yeah, they're kind of like that, except they're not cannibals, right. I think. <laughs> and, like first edition, you have character class requirements in order to ha- play a certain character class, whether it's a Dark Knight or the Errant Knight or a Knight or a Berserker or any of those things like that. And we'll talk about classes in a second. You have to meet the, the minimum requirements and so on. Um, uh, mm-hmm. classes. Now there's some new classes in here. Yeah, Again, yeah. this is this is material that you know that can easily be inputted into first edition. We already you know talked about this before in the past. Uh, you know past shows. They have a berserker class, an errant knight, a dark knight, a battle mage, a blood mage, and they have all the typical classes: your fighter and your cavalier, and you have your thieves and your and the assassins and the bard. You have all those regular classes that can be found in first edition AD and D. You even have the monk. Yep, the monk too. And I like the monk version in Hackmaster better than first edition. And why is that? I like the monk version in here because they actually it's a subclass of fighter and it has better hit dice. Well, yeah. The, and better armor class. The, I think the monk in Oriental Adventures was better than the original monk anyway. So. Yeah, the original first edition monk in the player's handbook was weak. <laughs> you know, the reason it was weak and everything is because of, of where they got their resources to create it. And, and they really wasn't too thoughtful about it and, and, you know, really thought out very well in advance what the monk really should have been like. But then again, remember, this D, first edition D&D was in its infancy in its stage. So I can't fault the creator. Well, or the, the, the first edition monk was perfect as far as I'm concerned because when I thought about it, I thought about them being brothers or like how we had that other discussion and you guys disagreed with me. Oh, uh, yes. Were, they were they, brothers. Brothers like you, the ones in the monastery with the long uh, – Well, from my, I thought they were more like the Shaolin monks. Yeah, I thought they were the, the long, long robes, the brown robes. You think the they're like the monastic order of like Franciscan friars. I, I, yeah, That's like, what I looked at them as sometimes. No, I, mean, I always thought them as like the Shaolin monks. Yeah. But see, I didn't stereotype. I didn't put a label on the word monk. And and, the, and, and then one person tells me, is it like that guy on that TV show? I was about to kill him. <laughs> I couldn't stand that. But back on subject again, monks. One thing that, you know, uh, that was brought up was the level titles. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think that's just awesome. Yeah. And I found some of the level t- titles to be a little uh, zany, a little uh, whimsical. Yeah. And, uh, and and stuff like that. See, me, I'm a serious gamer. I like some humor in the game and everything, but I just didn't like some of the titles and everything. They were just – some of them just kind of weird like – like, for example, if you look at the first level cleric, altar boy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, first level monk is grasshopper. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, parody, you know, lawsuit, you know. Yeah, that yeah. whole thing. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm just saying how it is and everything. The Druids were actually pretty good, you know, because they initiated the first circle, initiated the second circle. I thought that was pretty cool. I really liked that. And, and I might adopt the level titles back in the first edition and this stuff. I found the battle mages kind of, you know, kind of like kind of skirmish mage, melee mage. Yeah, Dolphin the battle mages mage. are, are oh, interesting. Yeah, Minute Mage, Second. I mean, I look at these and think, okay, really, seriously? Doughboy? I mean, <laughs> Doughboy, Doughboy. Uh, the, the Majors were good, and the Ranger was pretty, you know, decent. Ah, they was all good. You know, it's just like it says, it depends on what you want. The Paladin actually <laughs> has interesting, you know, titles to him. The Monk was kind of weird. I know Nick should, be ha- Nick should be very happy with the Cleric because it has a little parentheses there saying that depending on their deity... Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I have to say about magic users in in, in Hackmaster, it's a little different than first edition AD and D, is magic users start off in Hackmaster with three spells, instead of one. So you're just not some one shot. Yeah, one. yeah, I noticed that they had a lot more spells in first. Yeah, and so also what? you have what's known as if you take like for example the battle mage, who by 
for example, can wear armor. Yeah. And use certain uh your, well, he can wear armor, I think, like maybe up to ring mail or chain mail. It's his enemy. And he can and use certain types of weapons like short swords. Some Because he is what he is, a battle mage. He's yeah. built to go into battle. This is what, armor any, Nick. What? Armor any he can use. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's a thing called spell mishap. Yes. <laughs> yep, <laughs> Which you have that. to be careful for. Yeah, that's that's why you usually don't want to marry anything heavier than chain mail if you have really good intelligence and you can right. offset that a little bit. Are the... But they have a thing called um, spell jacking <laughs> where uh, – and this is specialist mages can do this like the, the battle mage for example. Basically what spell jacking does – they can cram more spells into their memory that is normally allowed for the mage's level experience. Okay. That so there's a danger to that. If you spell jack, there's a percentage chance that all the spells in memory can go off at the same time should a spell mishap occur. No. Oh. Yeah. Um, you can start spell jacking like a battle mage at fourth level, for and it's at one and a half times. So... Um, Normally, you have five first-level spells in two second, so you know, five times one point five, whatever that would be, what but like seven spells. Mm-hmm. So you would have instead of five first-level spells, you would have seven. But if you have a spell mishap, no, it's over. Yeah, all your spells go off, <laughs> all of them. You're like Fourth of July, boom. Yeah, that's why if you're gonna spell jack, you want to have a high intelligence to counter that spell mishap happening. So spell jacking is cool. And also we have what's called chain casting. What about the, have, Oh, sorry, God. Oh, oh, well, chain casting is like battle mages. They can chain cast. They basically can join with other spell casters and um, they can in, multiply the effects of a spell. And they can... Um, it increases the effect, range, duration, and damage rating multiplied by the number of battle mages particip- participating in the process. So, like, you have two battle mages, one sixth and one seventh level. They chain cast a fireball. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Individually, each would range 70 or 80 yards, but together the range is 140 yards, and the damage would be 14 dice. So yeah, chain casting is really good. <laughs> so what about the hack classes? Oh, the hack classes? Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk about those, Will? Or yeah, I'm gonna cover those in just a second. Okay, I thought you were moving on to those. Go ahead. No, no, no. I wasn't actually. I'm just going through just some of the differences and everything. I was gonna go back in a little bit, but you can cover the hack classes if you like. Go ahead, Dick. No, go ahead. Oh, the well, the hack classes really. Uh, I don't know what I could really say about it because I never knew anybody who actually had a hack class character because you have to reach a certain point in your career to qualify to be a yeah. hack class character. And the hack class stuff is actually in the Game Master's Guide. Mm-hmm. It is. And um, if I can find it here really quick. Well, they list them in the uh, player's handbook. Yeah, and there's a, yeah. actually a table here as far as the hack classes that's in the, the GM's guide. So you have to be yeah. playing for a while and have great honor to get into these classes? Yeah, you have to have high ability scores oh. for your prime requisites. They have to have a minimum of 18. You have to have a pretty good high charisma. So it's like prestige classes in third edition. It's like a prestige class in a way. Okay. And you have, you know, the hack cleric, the hack fighter, the hack mage, and the hack assassin. Hack assassin. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that those 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 hack classes are kind of interesting and everything. As I look at it from from my, my perspective is that the, the hack classes would be something like, you know, when you're you know, like um you know when the druid gets to that certain level and he has to fight the other druid to advance to the next level? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's almost something similar yeah. to like that, and that's just a thing. Or if you really want to be honest about it, I see that as a uh, prestige class. Yeah, we were just discussing that. 
Yeah, yeah we were okay. just thinking that. It's like, yeah, this sounds like prestige classes. And like I said, I don't think I known anybody when I was playing, when I've gone to tournaments over the years, anybody had like a hack class character. Everybody's standard character right. classes. Would they be too powerful to have someone start out as them? You can't start out as a hack. You can't class. start out oh, as one. Okay. Like you can't yeah, start yeah. off as a prestige class because in D20, yeah, that the minimum level usually was seventh level, yeah. and you have to meet all the prerequisites, the uh, feats, and all that other stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, same thing with Hackmaster, and you got added on. You have to be a certain honor level. And you have to have a certain amount of fame. Yeah. Fame. I wanna live forever. Anyway. Oh God. <laughs> Everything. Those are the three things that I was going to cover here really quickly is alignment, honor, and fame. Uh, you have fame, which that's not in first edition. We do have honor and we do have alignment. Reading the alignments, basically almost the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, nothing, you know, that stands out out of, out of the order or very extreme. But now let's get to the good stuff. If you look at page 91... You'll see one thing about quirks and flaws. Ah, yes. I'm glad we're going to talk about that. You know, and, and you know, quirks and flaws are very interesting. I, I, I find it very interesting how they do quirks and flaws. Um, and I've seen this in other games before where you could take, a, you know, a penalty or you could take a boon to your character and mm-hmm. you could do it multiple ways, you know. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And I forgot what page that was on. I think where you could cherry pick. Yeah, oh. and that's on that's oh. on page ninety one right there. You can either um, cherry pick your quirks and flaws, or you can roll for them. Right, and you know that that I mean, we had quirks and flaws in first edition D and D. Yeah, they did have and, them. Yeah. Huh? They were called mental problems in the back. Yeah. I, well, I'm, well, I'm not talking about that per, by the book. What I'm saying is people will create a character and say, well, he only has one hand. But we never associated a negative uh, or a positive, you know, issue with it. You know what I'm saying? Right. There wasn't a, there wasn't a mechanic associated with it. Right. Wasn't. And uh, so, I mean, I thought, I thought some of these were pretty cool and everything because, you know, you look at the, um, you know, some of the quirks like uh, albino or colorblind mm-hmm. or a lisp. That that would be very interesting for a pixie character. Yeah, I and the one thing about the quirks and flaws is whatever ones you get, that's more building points. That's right. So when you're creating your character, when you get these quirks and flaws, and there are mental and physical ones, you get more building points when you're creating your character, and that goes into when you're buying your skills and talents. And like that's any other game, if you roll for it, you get more bonus points, and if you then picking them manually. Right. And this is going to be the best part of all because we're going to discuss weapon specialization. Oh. For all you people out there with multi class fighters and everything, I got a surprise for you. This is oh, not Oh, here game. we go. That's right. Because it says here specifically, as such, I'm reading from the book to that guy who didn't like me. I'm reading from the book. <laughs> as such, multi class fighters or characters cannot use weapon specialization. It is available only to single class fighters. So, you know what y'all can do with y'all's house rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is they hack, made that this very specific here on weapon specialization. Yes, they did. They, Fighters, all that ambiguity over the years <laughs> in this game, no ambiguity. <laughs> so, I, I look at this as perfect when they when they discuss it. There's a reason why only fighters can specialize. If you want to know, buy the book, and I'll let you know. You can read it yourself because I ain't gonna tell you. It's page 102. Just let you all know. <laughs> But like on the quirks and flaws, there, are, there's, I have to tell you, as as a player and as a GM, when playing this game, um, if you roll for them, that's fine. But I can tell you, as a GM, uh, when we play a campaign, I I do this one thing. I have everybody write on there a sheet of paper, name of the character, class, level, quirks and flaws. Because as a GM, I will use them against you. <laughs> so if yeah, you yeah. have the alcoholic quirk, yes, it might be used against you. If you have, um, well, there's some really bad ones here. If you roll for them, oh, my gosh, like hemophiliac. You know, I hope you don't get that one. Or low threshold of pain. <laughs> you know? well, yeah, or narcolepsy or no death perception. But you see, this is my issue. 
It's a great idea. I like it. Mm-hmm. My issue with it is it becomes a distraction eventually. How so? And, well, I mean, it's a distraction. That's oh. like you just said then. You're going to use them against you. So this is something else that someone has to have the back of mind. Well, he has this quirk. He has this flaw. How can I use it against them? How can it, how can it boom me? How will it benefit them and everything? This is one of the elements that I feel does not need to be in a first edition game. If what? someone wants to play a character that's hobbled and blind in one eye, okay, you're hobbled and blind in one eye. There are no mechanics. I mean, there could be for house rules. Oh. But here now, you're adding a whole new element to a game. And that is what makes hack master a game onto itself with its own rule mechanics concerning their quirks and flaws. And that's fine. And, and, you know, it's good then, but what happens is, when you talk about a serious game, which is what I normally play with and everything, we don't want all those minute distractions. Well, I wouldn't be able to see that because I do have a depth perception problem, and not only that, I'm hobbled, so that means I have to have a wider boot. Would I be able to do... You know, it becomes an issue, or the character is a hunchback. Mm-hmm. Okay, will he make armor for a hunchback character? I have to tell you, I just don't need to get into all that <laughs> stuff. It just, it, I just, it, it's just a flood of, of stuff that's. Not, it doesn't make the game for me, in other words. And that's okay. one of. I like how they got it sitting here. It's good for Hackmaster because of what Hackmaster is. But for first edition, not necessary, not needed. To do each their own is basically what. Well, it is. that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying. Yeah, I know and you I disagree. What you're I, well, good. I, I'm glad you do. I have to disagree with you too, Will. I, I mean, I kind of like the idea of some of these things. They're interesting. And it doesn't mean that you're going to use them against the players all the time. That's I not just, what there you might said. Be, there, there might be. <laughs> situations. That's not what you said, no, Nick. I didn't say I was going to You said, I heard what you said. Yeah. You better go rewind this. We're going to rewind it back and listen to this. what you said. I said I would <laughs> use them. I didn't say I would use them all the time. It doesn't matter. You become the killer DM. See, that's why I try to avoid that. No, but you're just can't. assuming I'm going to be the killer DM. Okay? <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm being serious here. You know, <laughs> you're going to throw out those sorts of things out here. I'm, I'm going to tell you that's not true because you these quirks and flaws, when you have there, they're a part of your character. What makes that character a character? It brings a little more interesting things about your character. You don't have to take, like, that's, ten different quirks and flaws. My, my point is, I can create a first edition character with all these quirks and flaws in there and not have no issues. That's what I'm trying to say. Where you mean is the quirks and flaws won't even be quirks and flaws. It means, that's the whole point. I mean, so I you're gonna... So, so yeah. wait a minute. So, like, if you're going to have, like, uh, so you're telling me that a, a, a first edition AD&D character that was somehow an amputee, like, lost his arm, there's not going to be some sort of uh, detriment okay. to that character? No, not at all. Of course there's going to be. Oh, my God. You have just, got to be kidding hold me. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. He just won't be able to hold a shield. He won't be able to cast spells. He won't be able to climb a rope. He just play a mage. <laughs> he's gonna be climbing a rope. He's gonna do real those slow. somatic components with one arm. Yeah, he but can't. that's what I'm trying to tell you. Again, I, I don't see no need to complicate first edition A D D with nuances of that nature. That's not what D D is for. Then that's don't what happens. happens. Then don't, that's no. the whole point. But if I ha- if I wanted to play a one armed fighter in first edition A D D uh, that means one of two things. I either have a shield in one hand or I have a dog on a weapon in hand. That's all I can do. That's the only detriment. There's nothing in there that says you can't play those type of characters and you shouldn't restrict your players of not playing that and being creative at all. I have a problem with that. And let me tell you why, Vince. And that, I, I despise this when people play a character that can't talk. All right, that's a little ridiculous, but okay. Well, no, you, you made a comment. I'm just going to rebut on that because I can't right. stand that. It does affect the game. People do that. Or oh, I have a character that's always deaf. Or oh, I have a character that's completely blind. Well, why would you play a character like that? It's just going to be a total distraction in the game. There, I've seen this so many times that I despise it. I know what you're why talking about. Why would you want to play a character that doesn't talk? You're talking about that recent post that was in the uh, on, on Facebook. Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh, my God, that just kills me. Yeah. I mean, it's different if you have... I have a character that's completely hairless, okay? <laughs> no problem. You're completely hairless. Let's move on. You're, you're, you know you're what? an egg. If, if a person wants to play a deaf, mute character, I would say fine. And we, after one adventure of them not being able to do anything but just wander right. around, they're going to say, yeah. I'm going to make up a new character. 
Because the moment they say, you know what we should do, guys, I'll look at them and say, no, you can't say that. You can't hear or. <laughs> right. you got to have to write it down. <laughs> there you go. And that's exactly the whole issue with quirks and flaws. I mean, I see it good for Hackmaster for Hackmaster, and it's a value. But I don't see no real value. I mean, they got it in, 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 in uh, Dragon Magazine where they had some quirks and flaws and that weird stuff in there. I... Or, you know, even on the critical hit chart, if you have a broken leg or something, there's going to be some minus. That's that's understandable and everything. But I just don't really – when I play a fighter in first edition AD&D with no quirks and flaws, guess what? He is unique. Why? Because DM Will is playing that character with hit the way he plays and, and so on for everyone. I don't need quirks and flaws I... to make my character more <laughs> more colorful or whatever. Well, I did that in my group – on my face-to-face group. One of the characters actually – Stupidly, because he's a new player. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Stupidly. Yeah, he's going to probably tell him that. He's probably going to listen to this and go, well, I didn't do it on purpose, whatever. No, what did he do? He put on a ring without identifying it. Oh, that's well, stupid. There you go. And it was, it, was a, <laughs> it was a ring of stupidity, pretty much. <laughs> And so his... not only did a stupid character put on a ring of stupidity, it's just a stupid character now. His intelligence became three. Yep. So oh. he put the ring on, and basically he would be able to just do nothing communication-wise. He could hear people talking, didn't understand them. So in the middle of the group had a decision to make. He jumps in and says, so guys, what we do is I said, nope, quiet. You can't say a single word to the group because you're of intelligence of three, so you have no idea what they're doing. In fact, you like the water trickling on the wall right now. Yeah. I had to do that. So you're, you're So, Will, you're telling me that if you had a character, let's say he was a thief, and the thief, the quirks and flaws that you got were um, pack rat, pyromaniac, and uh, facial scar. Okay. That would that not make a kind of an interesting character to play with those quirks and flaws? I understand where I'm coming from. I have no problem with Hackmaster having that kind of stuff if they want to play a game that revolves around characters and their quirks and flaws, which when a quirk and flaw interferes with the normal flow of the game, I have a problem with it. That's what quirks and flaws But do. everybody, all the other characters have them too, so what's the problem? No, the, the problem is it interferes with the flow of the game. I am not... This is a game for people... Oh, so you're a game snob then. Ah. <laughs> oh, let oh me so now it comes out. You are a snob on the game. Oh, I see. No, 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 no. Let me finish. Hackmaster, it's, it's good for that game because it has that whimsical value to it, gameplay value for it. When uh-huh. I play first edition AD&D and when I run first edition AD&D, and this goes for most any games, I like a serious game. Let's get to it. Let's get the party together. They have a goal to accomplish. They have to overcome the obstacles. They have to So do- you're, there's no there's no fun then. No one can be funny in your game? No one can have a little bit of humor? We do have fun and laughs when we miss or we get attacked and, all, and a trap goes off and something happens to somebody. Yes, we have our fun. So, but the fun that we like to play is not the fun of the Hackmaster value fun. And it's what is that? What is the Hackmaster two, two <laughs> separate games. To to what, separate so so what is the Hackmaster version of Fun and Whimsical? The do you actually want to know that? Yeah, I want to know your opinion on it because I am going to tell you you're absolutely 100% wrong. No, no, no. I am not wrong because that is my personal opinion, and I can say this. What well, I'm to tell my you. personal opinion because I played this game for like but I 10 don't, years. But I don't think- Though that's the All whole point. Right. My children, point is, children, I'll take this. Ain't children. Don't. This is grown men. We're button heads now about a game right. that has right. some whimsical parody. See, to it. people wanted to hear conflict on the show. Now they're getting it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the whole point why I did this because now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be so adversarial right now. I'm actually kind of playing devil's advocate here, honestly. I know you that's are, it. and it's all good. Um, I am. That's it. And that's hey, right. And, hey, and you hey. know what? I, I do have to agree, though. It, some of these, some of those types of things, if you don't want them to port the first edition, you don't have to, and that's cool. You know yes. what? I'm turning this podcast around. We're going home, kids. That's it. No. Will, you sit on one side of the car. Nick, you sit on the other side of the car. <laughs> no, no, seriously, though. No, I like to just, uh, like I said, for this game, 
the quirks and, 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 and the flaws and all that is perfect for this game because of the nature of how it's played and how it's written. I mean, look at the modules. It is, it's kind of, when I mean, you look at, you know, like the Ravenloft one or all that, you can see where the, the humor and, and that comes in. Mm-hmm. I don't you know find what? too much of that in first edition AD and D. Actually, I don't. The modules are actually very serious. I can't wait. Like, look at Jets the Giants. I mean, we could go all day on this, but it's just a thought. But quirks and flaws for, for Hackmaster is perfect for this game and this mechanic and its rule set. It's, it's the way it's supposed to be designed. So next time when you run a game, uh, 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 Will, I'm going to have a one-eyed, one-armed, purple people eater as my quirk. You see what you started? (laughs) As a... What? But people eat. I have no problem. See, my thing is when people play a character, and, and you know, it is also the entire game, though, is when we talk about the character generation. What kind of character do I want? Off the bat, it's already a unique character of the person who's playing it. I just don't feel no need to embellish the character with quirks and flaws. And, well, that's <laughs> you. <laughs> in a first edition game. This is now, if I'm playing play. this game here, I'm going to quirk the flaw the hell out of it. This is put into place so it distinguishes Bob the Fighter from Bob the fighter enough pretty much right. let's just well, move on move much. on to combat Bob, move on Bob, he's fallen into a gelatinous cube pit that's for sure move on yeah, to combat <laughs> okay let's talk about the skills talents and professions now one thing good about hack i've been talking good about hack mass all day so give me a break anyway oh, I, I, was, I was just i was just i was just, <laughs> and I was just pushing your buttons yeah, I know it's all good. Skills, okay. talents, and proficiencies. Uh, definitely, this 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 uh, Hackmaster is very much superior to first edition AD and D, and even that of second edition AD and D. Actually, to be honest with you, on how they set this up, I see this as being the precursor to Dogon D twenty three point and on, because of some of the things that that are assigned to here and everything. And I know Vince, you don't like you know skills and all that kind of stuff. I, I or, hate skills now. Yeah, you know. I like it because I think it's important. and it, I think skills, talents, and professions is what makes the character useful in the game and doesn't, you know, detract from the game. So if you have a a, uh, a fighter who has a first aid skill, I think that's awesome. I no, think why I, do you need that's a, stuff I think Why do important. you need a skill to tell you you can do first aid? Most adventurers know how to do first aid. They know how to patch up their own wounds. You know what? You think the, the skills are useful? I think the quirks are useful. So, eh. <clears throat> Wait, let me do it. let me do it right. No, no, no. <laughs> okay there. Okay there. No, no, no. I don't think that everyone is capable of doing the same skill as a fit you know, and more efficient than the other. I just think that some would be more efficient than others. I think a cleric would be more efficient with a, a heal skill or first aid skill than uh, maybe a thief. Or if a thief has the first aid skill, he's more efficient in taking care of poisons and that kind of stuff. So I'm just being a little, you know, anal about that, just, just uh, in that offset. But again, that's what I think makes a character, you know, kind of, I like the flesh of that part of the character out with the skills, the talents, the professions. But that's what's going to make a group, you know, bind, bond with one another. Well, you make armor, I can make, you know, weapons, and that person over there can do this, and that person can do that. I think mm-hmm. we have group mm-hmm. it. That, I like that concept more so than I like the quirks and well, flaws that should detract from the game. You know but what? You're adventuring. You know what, Will? What? You're wrong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fixing the Incredible Hulk here in a second. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but no, the skills, talents, and professions will help you as you play the game, adventuring and so on, and you know, trying to accomplish missions, goals, and make it make it easier. Where the quirks and flaws just say. Hey, you're just a blind guy and big purple flying people eater. You know what? I like being a purple flying people eater, okay? With one eye. Uh, one of the things I did like uh, when you're talking about uh, the skills and talents in Hackmaster is the skill. Um, what is it? Um, I'm trying to remember. Arcane lore. Yes. And um, if I remember correctly, with arcane lore. Um, once you uh, know what, if an item is magical, I believe half your arcane lore, you can identify that magic item. Yes. So that's mm. one of the nice things. You don't have to use a spell slot for an identify spell. No, I don't if, like it. So no. you can use half your arcane lore uh, roll, and you you have a percentage chance of identifying that magic item. That's huh. so. That's one of the things I liked about it. Right. There's a lot of good things there, and I think that applies to all those characters revolving around magic to include thieves to help them, you know, figure out what a magic item is. Right. Again, 
It, it is awesome. I think this is something that first edition really missed out on, no. even though there are professions no. and stuff in, in the DMG. No, no, not at all. <laughs> no, wrong. See, you're wrong. No. And if Jason I'm was so sitting wrong. here with me, he'd agree 100% with me. Who? DM Jason. If he was sitting right here, he'd say, Nick, uh, Nick, wow, sorry, Nick. He'd um, say, Will, you're wrong. I'll give him a towel so I can wipe that brown nose off and everything. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just messing. I'm just messing around. No, no. I, like I said, I prefer simplicity. I like first edition as it is. I'm just saying that this could have been something that could have been implemented. It really wasn't implemented, and it didn't hurt the game for not. One, but for Hackmaster, it's perfect for it. It's perfect for it. Yeah, it's yeah, fine. But I wouldn't use it. I'd probably just throw it out. For Hackmaster or first edition? For both. Oh, oh, really? Yeah, wow. I okay. don't like skills. That's why I was asking you would it break the game if I didn't use skills. Yeah, you could take out the skills section. I guess it wouldn't break it. There. So, okay, yes. so combat. I want to know about combat. Okay, here we go. But let me just, my last thing on character generation, <laughs> real quick, like one, uh, one big bonus thing that I noticed in here is the character priors and particulars. I think that's a very important part of the game. Again, this is something that could be added to the game to make a character very much stand out, not needing, you know, blind eyes and big ears and one, you know, a hump on the back. Big ears? Well, yeah, maybe well, there's shelf. no big ear flaw. Maybe <laughs> Why well, not? Like, you know, it has the character age. Chronic Same. nosebleeds, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you have the character age stuff, and you have all the aging effects. You have the the handedness of character, whether it's left handed, ambidextrous, and so on. Uh, but, you know, height, weight, social class is given. Then it goes status of parents, illegitimate birth, table circumstances of birth, order of birth, family heritage. I think that could be somewhat useful for certain characters, maybe not all of them, but again, it could add a little punch there to the fleshing out of the character starting funds. You know, then it, it begins all the oh, stuff yeah. with the leftover building points starting money and modifiers and everything else. Mm -hmm. So again, something that's very interesting is that portion of, of the game that's really not in the first edition. Speaking, really about, speaking about money, what was the purpose of hard silver pieces? What was the purpose of it? Why would they add I don't hard? Know. Why did they add Because Electrum in? wasn't good enough? I, had, I have no idea okay, why they had hard silver. I was just curious. I, saw I that think the hard show. silver is equivalent to two gold. Yeah, I was just curious yeah. why they added another piece of mon monetary into the system. I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea. Right, I don't know the story with, behind that one. Continue with the combat. Okay. Combat. Um, <laughs> so here we go. Here, I'm going to be wrong a lot here, Vince. So I'm waiting for you to tell me I'm wrong. You're wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> combat. I, I love the combat. Combat is very, very similar to the first edition AD&D. One thing I found very awesome is the combat sequence. And how we do initiative. I thought this was very interesting. This added a new element to it that I found very odd here. Yeah. Step one, DM says, roll initiative. <laughs> as soon as he says that, any spellcaster in the party better say the word spell out loud. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. If he doesn't, yeah. he will be allowed to cast spells. No, you I announce know. spell. You have to announce spell. I thought that was kind of weird. That It's interesting and weird, but let me tell you why here in just a second. Step two, DM players roll initiative. Step three, actions made in order of initiative. Completely the opposite of first edition AD&D. And, do and it's a D10 roll. It's a D10, except for spells, which is a D4. Right. So that's how initiative is done. Initiative is rolled. Uh, everyone that's attacking melee weapons and all that other stuff rolls a D10. Spellcasters have to roll a D4. Yeah. And so, missile weapons, you go bows, go on one and six. Yes. And all other missile weapons go on one. Yep. Hmm. So then, so that's how they do the combat. That's how combat sequence is conducted in Hackmaster when there is a combat. Now, uh, I did notice that, now, now like I said, I, I played Hackmaster, you know, quite a few times, and, you know, it, it's, it's a very interesting system on how they do their things. Make sure you check into weapon specialization, fighters only, doesn't matter if you're multi-class or not, it doesn't apply if you're multi-class. Uh -huh, I told y'all. Anyway. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh... They need things in here concerning, you know, like uh, firing into melee, grenade-like missiles, you know, the taking cover against the missile fire, the full parry, uh, injury and death, uh, things that are not 
covered in fur. They should like overbearing. You know how the wrestling and punching and all that stuff was really, you know, weird like in first edition. Everything in Hackmaster is, I mean, it's clean, crisp, and to the point. You cannot mess this up as far as those rules. Charging an opponent, retreating, surprise. I mean, it, it's just amazing how a lot of these elements that are, uh, uh, you know, in first edition AD and D, but in Hackmaster, they're much more crisper in their, you know, when they're, you know, when you read on them, they're much more crisper. You know what you're doing when it comes time to combat. Yeah. Things that they didn't have in first edition is damage multipliers. Yes. Uh, the penetration damage. Yeah, we we touched on that a little bit on the penetration die. Yeah, right. and the follow through damage, which these were things that should have went into first edition AD and D, but for simplicity's sake, they were never put in there. And this right. was a shoe, Vince. If you remember, we was talking about it on you know on the forums when someone says, "Well, if I wear plate mail armor, then so much damage should be prevented." Well, you know, I love that system, but guess what? That's not first edition AD and D. No. That's chivalry and sorcery and horn master. Yeah. And I think there should be an optional system to where penetration and damage. But then again, everything changes when you introduce a system oh. like that into first edition AD and D. Couldn't they call yeah. it something else besides penetration damage? Well, well, yes, there is. I'll tell you what it is. And this is, and this is one thing I like about Hackmasters. As you like I said, I like Hackmaster for these rules because these are, are the rules that really make the game fun to play. Instead of saying you were in plate mill armor, you assign plate mill armor a point value or a strength value or a penetration value. For example, let's give plate mill a 10. Okay. In order for uh, a person to sustain damage, you have to overcome that penetration uh, 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 thing for it, which is 10. So if you do 9 points of damage, guess what? The armor takes the full damage. But if you take 15 points of damage, 10 gets absorbed by the plate mill, 5 gets absorbed through the body. So it's like mm-hmm. damage resistance then. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it comes down to, basically. All right. And, and th- that is it. A- I don't know if there's any anyone ever came up with some type of system where they completely modified the entire system of first edition ADD. But again, for simplicity's sake, let's remember what first edition mm-hmm. ADD was about. Being simple, the KISS rule. It was yeah. not to be, you know, all crazy and extravagant. As And Hackmaster to me is extravagant. And, and like Nick said, he said right there and everything, it, 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 there's more rules. It's, it's a bit more crunchy. There's a lot more elements added to it that will make the game, you know, I mean, it is what it is. It's a yeah. good Hackmaster is a good game. I have no problem with Hackmaster. I, I prefer a more serious game, and you know, and that's the reason why I play first edition AD and D. Sweet. Yeah, but but here's the thing though: the you can play Hackmaster seriously, and we and I oh, have. Of course. Oh, you co- and you're right. You're correct, and I'll take that back. I am wrong. I'm wrong. I admit I'm wrong. You could take Hackmaster and play it seriously and avoid all the little weird things. Yes, you can. You yeah. are- You could take Tune and play it seriously. It just depends how you play the game. Yeah. Toon, seriously? Oh, Lord. You're, I've you're, seen you're, people you're... play Toon seriously, trust me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's kind of weird, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, the one other thing, I don't know if you were going to touch on this on combat, is critical hits and fumbles. You know, that was... I was going to cover critical hits and fumbles. I mean, there is so much... I, I, cover. I didn't want to cover yeah. all nuances of combat, but please, if you want to brush up on it, please... I just... Just real quick on critical hits and fumbles, it's a very detailed system. Uh, I think, Vince, you said, like, um, well, anybody is uh, uh, familiar with uh, Rollmaster? Yes. Okay. Uh, the critical hit system is like Rollmaster, uh-huh. very detailed. Yeah. It gets down to organs, bones, <laughs> yeah, well and stuff out. like that. And, and I have to tell you, and it depends on what type of weapon, if it's a hacking you know, crushing or puncturing weapon. It depends on what type of critical hit. You have to roll a natural 20 on the 20 side die to do a crit, not exactly. modified. And there's some other factors involved I'm not going to get into, but suffice to say it's a very detailed system. In fact, so much detailed, people have written uh, ex- Excel uh, macros to run this so you don't have to roll a whole bunch of dice. Uh, yeah. Which I use. <laughs> Yeah, but and, it takes the fun um, I'm rolling for but, it, though. Yeah, that's why you have the 20-hit point kicker in Hackmaster, because 
it, uh, combat is can be very lethal, especially oh, when you're talking about the crits. Do the monsters get the 20 foot kick or two, or no? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But the- have the monsters get, and that's what makes this game so awesome, unlike first edition AD&D, where what players have, monsters usually don't have. Yeah. And, and like I said, that's Monsters what I, can crit you, too. <laughs> monsters can crit in first edition. My they, games, they can. If you have that, too, you, but what I'm, there's other, uh, other uh, factors that I'm, I'm including to the game is that what the monsters can do in this game concerning you know, what, what can be done with you know, oh, first yeah. edition. Just like my game, if, if a player rolls a 20 and they roll again, they roll another 20 or 19, they get more damage and they get to roll again. The monsters get to do the same exact thing. Right. Now, I, some DMs forget to do that, though. Or I shouldn't say that. Some players forget that it goes both ways. <laughs> the main is, and I, I, that's why when I play first edition AD and D, I make sure players do know that what you can do, yeah. monsters can do, and that includes leveling in classes. I allow monsters to level because I just cannot understand why you know that the logic of, of a monster always staying at one hit die for the rest of its natural life that they don't have the ability to learn and, and grasp. The, I just don't believe that. But uh, one thing I did want to bring up real quick, like and everything, was the Appendix L. Did you read that? Uh, all in Excel in the in the uh, player's handbook. Yeah, all things dice. All oh, the all oh, the dice thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how to roll the dice? Oh my yeah, goodness! Yeah. Yes, uh, among other things that they mentioned in there and everything. See, and, and like I said, Hackmaster is a game for those that want to get into a, a little more whimsical, you know, attitude and, and 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 you know, be more fun. I guess you could be more fun with this game and, and more. It's it can be a serious game, but I don't think that it was made for a serious role player. I don't. I have to disagree with that. No. Well, I too. I don't. I just don't think it's for a serious role well, player. Well, you know what? Well, you're wrong. Okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> Yeah, see, I don't – see, how it was written, there was a legal re- reason why it was written as a parody, so they can use those rules. Now – What about the new edition? The new edition is not a joke anymore. It's actually a serious game now. Yeah, because they couldn't use the first edition – or they couldn't use the D&D rules. Well, they, that's, that's their own decision. They dropped the 20 license, so – well, yeah. well, no, Wizards wouldn't let them renew it. <laughs> oh, was it? I thought you said that, that Jolly I mean, I mean, wanted yeah, to. They, and then well, it was up for to. renewal, and I believe the price was just not that. I went up again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So, pretty much, uh, you know, I hear me discuss the differences between First and, and Hackmaster. I covered a lot of – there is a ton more, and there's no way that I'm, I'm going to uh, take over the show and go over every – difference uh, of each other game uh, both, both games are different one is uh, uh, both are good games in their own right uh, some are, you know it, it's, it's just one of those things didn't Jolly consider just going under the open 20 instead of the parody license I think that was one of the things he did consider but they just went with the whole new system ah. they basically fun. they basically modified what they had from their aces and eights yeah. Western role playing game, which, by the way, I have to highly recommend if you're into Western. If you want to find something that's in like Old West, that is really fun. Well, then why, <laughs> why do you like that, but not like the new Hackmaster? I like the game mechanic that was associated with Hackmaster Fourth Edition. Okay. I like that it took some of the stuff from your favorite first game, edition, yeah. AD and D, some from Second, and put it together. I uh, some of the stuff in in the new version of Hackmaster is okay. I just don't like the combat system all that much. And I'm and this is coming from a person who was on the play test for for Hackmaster. So, <laughs> but what is wrong with it? Well, for it's not with what's wrong with it. It's just it's just a personal taste on it. It's the the initiative is a rolling initiative, yes. and to me, it's a lot to track. Yes. And also with combat, it's opposing die rolls. Which is annoying. It's not, yeah, it's not based off a matrix of armor class and level per se. It's more of opposing die rolls. Your level as the class does factor into it, but it's... Yeah, and there's half damage and full damage. and Right. Quarter damage it, too, maybe? I don't know. I'll remember that correctly. Was there but no? that's, that's the big difference. There's no... 
attack matrices to go by. It's just opposing D20 rolls from attacker and defender. You can have a perfect attack. You can have a perfect defense. You can have all those sorts of things. It's it's interesting in its own right. It's per, for myself personally. It's just not what I really care for. <laughs> well, I want you to sleep better tonight. I want you to know that I totally agree with you. I am not a fan of their new system. I thought, like, what in the world were you doing? Well, I, I we've already care. expressed our opinions on the new system. No one really enjoys it, unfortunately, and sorry, but, you know, that's that. <laughs> we've already went over that. So let's just go on to our next segment before we uh, get more attraction from the Hackmaster Society again. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are advertising their product and everything. Yeah. Good Lord. All right, so let's head into the creature feature next. Are you saying that I put an abnormal brain into a seven and a half foot long gorilla? Creature Feature Theater. It's alive! It's alive! Okay, we're in the Creature Feature Theater this week, and uh, we're going to pull out a monster... uh, a different type of monster that we're not used to. And, uh, Nick, I believe you have that in front of you, the Gummy Fiend. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, if you uh, want to go with something a little weird, we could do the Gummy Fiend. Absolutely. And so, which book is that one in? Yeah, the Gummy Fiend is from the Hacklopedia Beasts from Hackmaster. And uh, it is... A creature that's basically like a giant mass of uh, gummy worms. So, <laughs> gummy bear. Uh, this is one of the creatures, and the, one of the reasons why I picked this is um, actually Dave Kenzer hates this monster. Ah. <laughs> uh, it's also known as the sugar fl- slug. Yeah, if you get, kill one of these things, it's worth two thousand experience points. It. It's uh, animal intelligence, neutral. It's a large creature. Armor class 8, number of attacks 8. Damage attack 1 to 6 times 8. 11 plus 1 hit dice. Um, Description, gummy fiends are exceptionally large slug-like creatures with 8 long flexible tentacles, despite the fact that it apparently has no sensory organs nor any need for a mouth. The gummy fiends... Head sports a maw surrounded by many smaller tentacles. The two prominent eye stalks swivel curiously in all directions in response to sound, movement, and light. Um, a gummy fiend's hide shimmers with several translucent colors, including green, yellow, orange, and red. A gummy fiend that has not eaten recently may have a cloudy gray or nearly clear skin. Uh, combat tactics. They can attack up the four different opponents at once. <laughs> It's made of a sticky substance that holds anything fast when it touches. Weapons that strike may be stuck unless an opponent can make a strength check at minus two. Um, they also, the victim struck must save her support and be stuck fast, needing an open doors roll to break free. Um... Clothing and weapons begin to dissolve immediately once they come in contact with gummy fiends. They take half damage from lightning and cold attacks, but are susceptible to fire. They take all saves at minus four. The creatures have an ability to grow back severed limbs. Um, gummy fiends live in temperate climates, migrate north during the summer heat. <laughs> if temperatures get above 80 degrees, they begin to melt. And, um, yeah, the their entire body is made of a single cohesive substance. And, um, yeah, it's kind of one of those weird creatures. I never used one. It's just one of those weird <laughs> creatures that they add. It's like, okay, we need this for the parody factor in Hackmaster, so we're going to add a giant gummy creature. Now, is so. there anything different? There's nothing really different than the monsters just of the 20-point hit point kicker, right? Not really. Um, I mean, yeah, you just add 20 hit point kicker and there you go you got a hack master creature but as far as like comparing like a hack master orc to a first edition orc there's no difference same hit dice same armor class and all that cool so i mean there's one other creature that is a little more i guess if you want to say normal is uh it's one called the indigo ambusher 
or is known as the blue lightning worm. And this one's a two-hit dice creature. It kind of looks like a Kowatul, but except it has bat wings. And they're about... Um, they're about uh, three feet long. And what they do is they're like, it's like a flying snake creature. And what it does, it'll fly into its face of prey and... The ambusher always goes for the victim's neck and strike with a minus two to hit. And when they hit the neck, they inflict one to four points of damage each round. They will not let go until the victim is dead, so they'll wrap around your neck. Cool. So that's one type of creature. They also, once on the second round after a hit, the ambusher strikes the victim with its tail, automatically hitting for two to 12 points of electrical damage. Well, it's a little flying two-hit dice creature that can do electrical damage. So, <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah, uh, there's cool little creatures in there. I think the big thing on the creature feature about this for Hackmaster is, I think it's a good place if you want to get these Hacklepedias. You can mine it for creatures that poured into first edition, like this Indigo Ambusher, and it, they even take like the you know your basic orc, for example, and they've made all different types of orcs that they've added. Like the uh, cloven hoofed orc, which is probably a relative to the pig faced orc, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, there's all different variety of trolls in Hackmaster. They've added to the different varieties of dragons. Like the besides your standard ones, there's one called the albino scoria dragon, which is really really nasty. And so yeah, so that's uh, you know the gummy fiend, which is a really silly creature. I'll admit it, and I've never used it, and never will. And there's the indigo ambusher, which is a flying blue lightning worm snake thingy. You know, it's funny when you bring up the uh, the gummy uh, monster, yeah, because the gummy monster almost sounds similar to the adherer that's in the fiend folio. Yeah, but yeah, it's yeah, it's well, like that. Yeah, because if you if you touch it, you get stuck to it. If you hit it with weapons, the weapons can get stuck to it. In order to pull the weapon off, you have to make a strength roll to, to pull the weapon off. The only way you can you can get rid of the glue or the the stickiness is uh, using either alcohol or hot water, and that's how you destroy the uh, you damage when using hot water. Now, Nick, how would you translate the hack factor into the monsters for, for first edition, or just ignore that? I would just ignore the hack faster, hack factor, and okay. just go by you know what the hit dice is and use your best judgment. Okay, that's what I would do. <laughs> I do like the picture on the back of volume. Um, what is it? Five. It's the uh, type eleven demon. And he has a picture. <laughs> it's the picture from the first edition monster manual. I mean the player's handbook. Yes. And he's <laughs> dipping the person in the flaming pot, and he's got another one in his teeth eating it. Yeah. That yeah. is a really cool how they did that picture. Yeah, the Type 11 demon. <laughs> yes. All right, so let's head into uh, the new segment, Treasure Chest, coming up next. You have opened the Treasure Chest. You may choose an item. Treasure Chest. Let's see let's what we pull out of the Treasure Chest this week. I was thinking about when I was looking through the uh, GM guide or the Hackmaster guide. Mm-hmm. Uh, the staff of the dark mage. I, I don't think I've ever oh, seen. Oh, it's a good item. I don't remember seeing that in anywhere in first edition, really. Unless you want to compare it to the staff of the magi, but not really. Staff of the dark mage is so nasty. <laughs> Lesser. It has seven d ten charges. First of all, yeah. Has a constant aura of camouflage about it, which grants, grants the owner a fifty percent bonus to all skill checks relating to hiding and concealment. Well, that's kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Lesser dark side strike, the effect one charge, a bolt of necromatic energy lashes out from the, the staff to the target bearer's choice, causing 1d8 points of damage. Wow. Lesser shadow transformation turns the skin jet black. Hmm. Huh. Why would you want that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe blend in the shadows, help yeah, you blend in so. the shadows. Dark, I can understand darkness, 15 foot radi- radius. Greater shadowy transformation. Everything turns jet black. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, maybe right hide in the shadows. Meld with the shadows. Basically, it comes one with the shadows no matter what. And the great dark side strike. 1d20 point, points of damage. Yeah. Or die. Ouch. Victim must make a saving throw versus death or die instantly. Wow. No, with no chance of being raised. 
That's good. I like that. I like the kill factor. Yeah. And it uses five charges, that greater dark strike. Ouch. Wow. The bearer can, in the shadow walk, the bearer can step into any shadow and instantly emerge from any other. So it's kind of like a teleport into the shadow wise. Yeah. Holy cow, what a weapon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's nasty. That's definitely an artifact, I'll give you that. Mm. And it's not listed under artifacts or relics. I know, but that shouldn't. It isn't, that's right. Huh. But the staff of the Magi is on the same page is also not listed under artifacts, so. Yeah. That's it should be, though. The Staff of the Magi is just a powerful magic weapon. should be rare to find. Yeah. That, that's just a rare item. It's a, a very powerful item, but it's not up there with the artifacts or that, that, that sense. But I'm looking at it from both perspectives of the Hackmaster and, and uh, First Edition, though. A lot of and if stuff. anybody wants to know, if you have ever read the Knights of the Dinner Table comic, yeah. yes, the Hackmaster class swords are listed in the GM's guide. Oh, cool. All right. I, I read Especially that. Especially Carvin Marvin. Oh. <laughs> anyway, that's basically just an item to throw out there for you. You can see how the deadly the items are different compared to first edition. Yeah, it, but you still got plus one swords. Oh yeah, you still got the base. Yeah, you still have all the. <laughs> you still got your standard plus one swords and all that stuff. So, are you ready for this, there, Vince? Ready for what? To make you happy. Uh, okay. What's gonna make me happy? Watch this. Now, you remember we talked about character generation and everything. You know, we, we only covered a little bit on multi-class and dual class and everything. Yeah. And, you know, fighters, only fighters can specialize. Yeah. But watch this, though. Wow. It says here on clerics that multi-class, regardless of, uh, of other classes, a multi-class clerk must abide by the weapon restrictions of his mythos. Uh, Thus, a fighter uh, clerk uh, can uh, order uh, use only bludgeoning weapons. <laughs> now, on top of that, a magic user, multi-class magic user, can freely combine the powers of the magic user with any other spell class allowed, although the wearing of armor is restricted by the spell mishap probabilities as normal. Okay. See that? Yeah. And a thief cannot do any thieving abilities other than open locks or detect noise if he's wearing armor that is normally not allowed by thieves. So just because you have a multi-class character does not mean you have access to all the other abilities of other classes. In the Hackmaster, that is true. Well, that applies to first edition AD and D too. Oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna pick and choose what new rules are gonna apply here. Okay. <laughs> Well, being it's so non-specific in first edition, this here only verifies the fact that the people of Hackmaster, Kenzer Company, realized, that, you know what? I believe that's what it means. So I'm going to stick with that. Do you think that, did they contact Gygax or Anderson about any of this stuff, do you think, Nick? Um, I Yes, they have. In fact, I do recall Gary being on the uh, forums for a while mm -hmm. when he was alive. Right. Um, Dave Arneson, don't really know. So Gary but I know I know Gary was on the forums for for quite some time. So he maybe had a little input in this in this book. I don't know of any input into the game itself, but he um, uh, he uh, was part of the forums for a number of years after Hackmaster came out. Yeah, they they, they didn't even mention his name in here. I was just curious because I know around the time that. Uh, they wanted Gary to approve third edition. He said, I don't think so. And Dave said, sure, I like it. I'm approving it. And so he was their spokesman. So I was just wondering if Gary jumped on the bandwagon for this. No, not that I'm not that I'm aware of. The only uh, acknowledgement he has is at the beginning of the books where, you know, it, where it was originally based upon what rules. And I do like that each uh, Hackopedia Beast book has a reality check at the beginning of it. Yeah, all the books. Yeah. Do. It's like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> it's like, this is a parody game. And it does say that. So, yeah. Well, there is the Hackmaster special double sized issue again for two hours. People have been requesting this in the forums nonstop. Talk about Hackmaster. Nick keeps talking about it. Okay, so, there you go. There you go. <laughs> what, issue, volume number three, issue 101. The Hackmaster for E edition. We got that off our chest. Yes, and that, that's enough with Hackmaster because you know the, the, we can't cover the new one because it doesn't really. If someone, I know someone's going, would you cover the new one? Well, the new one doesn't really relate to first edition, so we can't cover it. No, it really doesn't. Uh, the only reason why we're covering it here because this is so close to first edition. Yeah. So I'll have to note that you know if you really need to, you need to get the Hackmaster stuff now as soon as possible. It is out of print. It's never going to yeah. be in print again. That's not going to be in print again. That's correct. 
They so will not allow it on what eBay it. or Noble yep. Knight, whatever's out there, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, see, I noticed here that they said Kenzo and Company announced that Kingdoms of Calamar replaced Garwee's World as the game's default setting, which is interesting. Ugh. I'm trying to remember what happened in 2007. <laughs> that's true. That's when they lost their, uh, that's when they lost the license to use the original D&D rules. Yeah, that's what it was. It had to been. Wow, that's interesting how that all just plays in there. Yeah, so there. So there, yeah. You're wrong, Will. I'm wrong. <laughs> but know. you're also right. Yeah, but you could be no, right. No, 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 I'm all wrong today. That's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to bed depressed tonight and everything. I'm saying, oh, you know, you know, you're not. Will, what's another game you hate? There's very few games. Oh, I don't want to talk about that right now. Uh, let's talk about, um, I don't know. I don't hate games. I really don't hate any <laughs> games. I just prefer a certain type of game over other games. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> no. I don't no. like Buffy the Vampire Slayer game. Why not? No, I'm just joking. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> All as right. Long as, you don't li- as long as you say you don't like the game Fatal. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you. you just, <laughs> see, now I am going to bed depressed. You mentioned that. <laughs> No. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. Keep going, I keep guess we're school. leaving now. <laughs> oh, he wants us to go. Good night, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Enjoy Hackmaster. Bye. <laughs>